We're talking today with Lauren Ramsey of Mona Shores, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, now Lauren, begin with some background on yourself. Uh, to begin with, uh, where and when were you born? Uh, I was born uh, March 20th, 1923, um, and my mother passed away when I was three years old. Mm -hmm. And my dad never remarried, and uh, I was brought up in my younger years by a couple of housekeepers. And then uh, my oldest daughter, or uh, a sister, uh, I had an older brother by three years, and my sister was six years older than I did. When she got old enough, she took over the management of the house, and my dad worked for... Uh, a uh, 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 dairy. He was a milkman, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, my sister ran the house until she was 18 years old and graduated from high school. And uh, uh, then uh, she got a job with the General Telephone Company, and she met another uh, employee, and they got together and they got an apartment, and she moved out. It was glad to get rid of the job of keeping house for mm -hmm. everybody. Well, then we batched it, my dad and my brother and I. Okay. And, and where were you at this time? Uh, we lived at 828 Dale Avenue in Muskegon, Muskegon Michigan. We lived okay. a couple blocks away from the Highland Park Dairy where my dad worked. Okay. And uh, uh, I... Uh, uh, went with my dad a lot. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was nothing like it is now that they didn't care whether you uh, uh, went and, uh, but my dad was a route foreman and he had six routes that he uh, took care of and he had three horse routes and three truck routes. And I don't know whether it was in the summertime where they delivered milk uh, at night so that when you wake up in the morning because there was no refrigeration, mm -hmm. you had a fresh bottle of milk on your doorstep. But I would go with them in the summertime when I was on uh, vacation, mm -hmm. summer vacation from school. And he used to pay me a dollar and a half a week for going with them. So I, I had a lot of experience in uh, meeting people and going around. Uh, I, I, I didn't have time to go out for football and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, my life was pretty much all work, work. Right. And uh, I had my uh, household duties that to do. Uh, I had to buy the groceries on Saturday, but that a little plush because then my dad would let me drive the driss car. And so I would pick the grocery store as far away as I possibly could so I could drive. But three blocks away was a AP store that I could go to, but I went way out in the Heights. It was a store that I knew about when I was with my dad on the milk route, and that's where I went. And I met my wife in this grocery store in, in the Heights, uh, and uh, that was a long time ago. Right. But uh, when the war broke out, my brother was one of the first ones to be drafted. Mm -hmm. He was in the in the lottery, and his his number came up real quick. And he ended up in the South Pacific, and uh, he ended up in the Fiji Islands. And uh, you ain't gonna believe this, but all he did was made ice cream all the time he was in the Fiji. Uh, he had a summer job and a job at the dairy where my dad worked, mm -hmm. and he made ice cream. Uh, he worked with a guy that was the ice cream maker and he learned how to make ice cream and all the flavors and all that and that's that's how he got involved in the ice cream business. Right. And, and, and so the military actually placed somebody where he had the right skills. That's, that's good, good that, for them. That's what they interview you when you're inducted. They, yeah. they give you a really a background check. They okay. want to know what they got. All right. Now for you, did you finish high school? Oh yes. Uh, I uh, uh, graduated in 1941 okay. in June, and uh, uh, I worked at the dairy uh, 
uh, I paid got paid fifteen cents an hour, and when I I got a work permit, permit you had to be fourteen mm -hmm. to get a work permit. I shoveled ice cream during my summer vacations, mm -hmm. and I get fifteen cents an hour, and I would work ten hours a day on Sundays and some days that was mm -hmm. holidays and stuff, and in those days I made pretty good yeah. money. Yeah. Uh, you know, I worked 10 hours and I got a buck and a half. All right. Yeah. Now, before Pearl Harbor happened, were you paying much attention to what was going on in the world, in a war in Europe, that kind not, of thing? Not really. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, just what you read in the paper, you know, mm -hmm. but I couldn't say that I was, uh, you know, really delved into it too, uh, too much. So you weren't really thinking about how we might get into a war or anything else like that? No. Okay. No. So how did, yeah. Uh, Pearl Harbor, of yeah. course, you know, hit everybody real real hard and, and sudden and it was a real eye-opener and all we had was the radio you know and and the paper and uh, uh, it was a shock yeah. how did you hear about it on the radio on the radio okay yeah and uh, that's how I, I heard about it but my brother was drafted very quickly after that okay. in other words I think Roosevelt declared war on January 14th or something. It well, was probably December 14th or before that, because December 7th, 41 is Pearl Harbor, and so we're at war. Yeah, but it was in January of 42 that he actually declared the war, war on, okay. on Germany yeah. and, and Japan. But, uh, yeah, he, he was uh, uh, inducted in, uh, uh, it was called Camp Shanks in... in uh, in Pennsylvania, and uh, he was shipped out real quick out to the South Pacific. Mm -hmm. And as I say, yeah. he ended up in the Fiji Islands. Mm -hmm. But uh, he never spoke about it much. But uh, I guess a person, you know, it, it's something you don't mention. But he did his duty. He did right. what was told. Right. You know, you don't have no control of mm -hmm. what, what the, what's going to happen to you. Well, uh, he, he was at the time he was drafted, he was working uh, at the Central Paper Company as a, in the lab. He was making routine tests of the paper making process throughout the plant. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he was drafted, uh, he got them to hire me to, to, to replace it. Mm -hmm. So I spent about maybe six months uh, doing the, uh, the job that he had at the right. paper mill. It's it, it, making these uh, lab tests and all that. Right. Now, did you try to enlist yourself? I, I tried to, yeah. Okay, tell that story. Well, uh, um, my dad uh, wasn't in favor of it, but I, I went down on my own to Kalamazoo. That's where the induction center was. And I paid my own bus fare down there, and I stayed overnight in a hotel. Went through the uh, the uh, physical examination and so forth, and they rejected me because they said I had hypertension. Okay. Now, what program were you trying to enter? I was trying to get into the cadet program to be a, a pilot. Okay. And I wouldn't take nothing other than that, so they sent me home. Mm -hmm. Soon after that, I was uh, drafted, okay. and uh, no problem. All right. And uh, now, where did you report to first when you're drafted? Uh, we went. It was, we shipped out of here. There was about four rail car uh, passenger cars that uh, went to Camp Grand, mm -hmm. Illinois, mm -hmm. and we all ended up ended up there. And, uh, that's where we uh, got our shots and another physical, and uh, we got all the uh, uh, tests, both written and oral and interviews and all that. We got our uh, uniforms and stuff. Okay. But now to this, this was... day, I can't remember what the hell happened to our uh, clothes. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so they're supposed to ship home, probably, but it, who knows? I don't know what happened to the clothes. So, but so this is early 1943 now we're talking about. That's what's on your service record yeah, anyway. Guess, yeah. Okay. Well, when we was ready to ship out, uh, one of the corporals that was in the cattery of Camp Grant uh, took uh, three or four of us and 
we, uh, he said, you're in the uh, our chemical warfare. And he took us down to, it was called Camp Cybert, Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, we went by train, and uh, it was a uh, wartime camp, tar paper barracks, uh, everything was tar paper, gravel roads, everything, but it was strictly wartime deal. Everything was, uh, we had barracks that probably held, no, oh, maybe 25 guys. And they were up on cement blocks off the ground and no, just studs in the inside and paper, uh, tire paper, paper on the outside. And uh, the, the latrine was down the street and uh, the mess hall was down the other way. And then they had a, a kind of an office deal where the officers hung out and they run the place. And they had a little uh, uh, supply uh, area. But it was, it was, it was okay. Mm -hmm. There was a pot belly stove at the end of each one, and so forth. Okay. But now, were you getting basic training there, or were they already putting you? Basic training. Okay. We went, yeah, and basically, uh, everything was pre-war, pre-World War, I mean, pre-war. It was old stuff. So, like World War One vintage equipment. There you go. It was old stuff. Uh, we had leggings and shoes and... Uh, uh, we we had the, the rifles we had were uh, Enfield rifles. Uh, they were English Enfield rifles, old old stuff, and uh, everything was pre uh, old. It was nothing that was new. Mm -hmm. Everything was old. Well, uh, basically, uh, they emphasized uh, uh, army uh, courtesy. Uh, discipline and definitely uh, physical conditioning. Okay. Uh, the rest of it was very it was old, and it, it, they they didn't have the stuff to t tell you. But we we saw one M1 rifle that that was the only one that we seen. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what kind of physical shape were you in at that time? I was about 20 years old or 19. Yeah. And you know, I was at peak condition. Okay. But we had guys from, you know, um, that were fat and others out of condition, you know, and they, they never uh, got off the sidewalk, you know. They come from New York City, all over the country, you know. But I, I had no problem at all. In fact, uh, basically what they do, they try to uh, com have you compete. In other words, I was in the third platoon. Of, of the company, and they do that by what your name is. In other words, first platoon is everything from A to probably uh, D or E, and, mm -hmm. and then the second company. And then, but I was an R, so I was in the third. Mm -hmm. Well, they they uh, try to get you to compete. In other words, which is the best, much the best platoon, and so it's always I'm the best platoon, or this is the best platoon. So it's always that competition and I could run them in the ground I could run them in the ground I, I had no problem at all that was it I mean uh, that the officers would, would drop out before I, I I mean I I just enjoyed that just uh, outdoing them I had no problem okay what about with the discipline part were you no, no problem there either but they weeded out the gold bricks and the uh, screw-ups real quick that didn't take them very long and if you was a screw-up uh, you was on latrine duty and, and that kind of stuff and they uh, you but you was brushed aside they they don't want no part of you okay but if you were just a gold brick uh, they took care of that too uh, they put you out there in the front after hours digging a, a, a hole uh, uh, up to your ears, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 it would be in way after dark. And you're still digging, you know. Yeah. Would they do you, things where if one person screwed up, they'd punish the whole unit? Or? Sometimes, okay. particularly on inspection. Uh, you always had a Saturday morning inspection, and uh, if you screwed up or somebody did in the barracks, uh, you wouldn't get a weekend pass. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, there was a bunch of self 
disciplining uh, done. It wasn't all by the officers right. and everything. But we had good officers and we had some we called uh, shoe salesmen. And uh, I would say there was probably about 50-50. Okay. And, uh, now how long did you stay uh, at, at Camp Cyber? What, your 10 weeks. Yeah, okay, just 10 weeks. But I told you that uh, I, I had this punch a wound and they sent me to, to the dispensary and they bandaged it up and so forth and they gave me a tetanus shot. I was allergic to tetanus. I didn't know it. Or at least the shot, it. yeah. I ended up in the hospital. I, I couldn't lift my arms the next morning and, and it was terrible pain. And all they did was give me morphine. And the doctors, they prayed at every doctor they had in, in the place by me and they, they couldn't come up with what the answer was. And finally one of them worked it out and they gave me an antibiotic and mm -hmm. I, I popped right out of it. And I was back in uh, uh, the ranks uh, real quick, but I missed a whole week. Right. Now, you mentioned uh, the prospect of getting weekend passes. I mean, if you got off base on a weekend, what could you do? Well, at this Camp Cybert, not much. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even remember that there was a town, or if it was, it wasn't much, because I don't remember ever going mm -hmm. to, to town. Or right, anything. okay. But you could get off base, I would say that. But I don't remember anything about ever getting off base to a, a town or something. All right. So uh, to go back then to your main story. So you you have the tetanus shot reaction. You get over that. You rejoin your unit. And then what happens to you then when the training ends? Now what? Well, uh, when the training ends, why they're all shipped out. Basically, uh, the, the outfit goes to a, uh, a division or uh, mm -hmm. some unit where they get actually uh, more training and right. uh, uh, it's a different kind uh, uh, depending where you're shipped. Uh, I was told that the, most of them were shipped and ended up in Italy. Mm -hmm. But in my case, I was segregated out and I was the only one and I just thought it was because I had missed a week of training in, in the uh, hospital. But that wasn't the case at all. They uh, gave me my orders and a bus ticket uh, to uh, Auburn College. And they put me on a bus and I ended up at Auburn. And I didn't know what was going on. I, I just followed orders to go to Auburn. And so I, I, I did. When I got to Auburn, why? I was there for maybe uh, 10 days or so. And they kept trickling in guys from all over. And when it got up to about maybe 15, 20 guys, they shipped us to Nashville, to uh, Vanderbilt University. And uh, then I come to the realization that I was in ASDP. Okay, and what was that? That was Army Specialized Training Program. A very controversial uh, 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 outfit, I guess mm -hmm. you'd call it. Uh, I guess a lot of them in the Pentagon uh, agreed that it was good, and others didn't think it was good. There was a loss of a lot of manpower that they needed. And right. Now, what was the purpose of the program? Well, I only found this out by talking to a friend that was in ASVP at the uh, Tanglewood mm -hmm. Senior Center where I met. He was in ASDP too. He had a whole book on it and his situation was entirely different. He had to apply for it and take a uh, uh, intelligence or a IQ test and all kinds of things but he finally was accepted. But me, I, I just, I don't know. But, uh, but what was the specialized training for? Where were they, what well, were they going to send you to? This is what the book written, and this is what I was told. Yeah. Is it was a prelude to officers' candidate school. Mm -hmm. In other words, you would go, and if you could cut the mustard, and, and, and you did everything, uh, then you went to officers' candidate school. Okay. And then uh, the way they were doing it now, I guess if you had some political friend, or your dad was a garbage collector, or maybe the city mayor of some town, you know, they was in uh, officer's candidate school, but this was a different situation. They was going to take 
the cream of, of the crop, mm -hmm. so to speak. But wasn't a lot of the training for engineers specifically? It was engineering. Was, right. Our course was this, and it was not my bag at all. I'm, I'm a business person. We had calculus, uh, chemistry, uh, American history, English, and uh, uh, physical conditioning. Right. So now, a lot of it's regular college courses. Definitely. No, yeah. They were taught by college professors and so forth. And if you couldn't cut the mustard by, then they booted you out real quick. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I had rough going, but I had a good friend. Uh, his name was Whitey Seam. Smart, dude, smart. He was really what. He was my tutor, mm -hmm. and he he was my uh, my godson, I guess you'd say, but uh, helped me a lot. Uh, the calculus was way way over my head, but I managed to mm -hmm. uh, stay in there and until it was dissolved, and uh, uh, we uh, we had probably uh, about a year at at, at Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was good time. It was good. Uh, and uh, we marched to class, and we uh, had to stand reveille and, and, and night um, bed check and all that. It was, and we had a. I was an A uh, A company, and there was another one was B company, and we had officers that run the show. Uh, first lieutenant was was the head of the uh, outfit that I was in. Well, anyway. Uh, uh, when it was dissolved, and it was very quick, it was just like this, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it, it was like maybe in the middle of the week, you know, and all of a sudden they said, you don't go to class today, we're going to do this, and, you know, we didn't know enough. They don't tell you nothing. You know? Okay. Before we go any further with that, let's talk a little bit more. You, you spent, you know, the better part of a year there. Uh, did you have to spend all of your time sort of studying or in your rooms or well, doing things officially, or did you get time off? Uh, we we had uh, pretty much uh, the weekends off. Mm -hmm. uh, we had inspection, and we passed inspection, and then we would get Saturday afternoon and Sunday off, and uh, we could do pretty much what we wanted to do. But if you could pretty much, if you was up on your studies and stuff, but you sometimes you'd spend your time uh, studying, mm -hmm. and uh, you could go to the library and so forth and everything, but. We had dances at the gym uh, on Saturday night sometimes, and uh, they would truck in, uh, bus in uh, girls, and they had a lot of Vanderbilt girls too. Mm -hmm. see, uh, and uh, but we had a good situation in that we got girls from Peabody, Peabody Ladies College, Women's College. Mm -hmm. It was very close by; you could see it from the campus of the Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. And then there was one other one that was called Ward Belmont Finishing School. Ooh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Those gals were, <laughs> when they come to the dance, they have about three chaperones. <laughs> they really had them on a short leash. But uh, you can get around them, and uh, once you find out their name while you was in, uh, you know, you because they was only probably about maybe six, eight blocks down the street, you could go on Saturday, and mm -hmm. and, uh, and you could go and and if you know who to ask for, and you could you could make a date, and if you did, you could make a date, and they got out on Saturday afternoon too, and but <laughs> that was not too good. They came with white gloves to their elbows, a hat, and. Uh, uh, a purse and silk stockings and a real fancy dress, you know. And mm -hmm. oh Christ, uh, that was <laughs> well. It was about probably six, eight blocks to the bus stop, and there was a place where the was a watering hole for the drinkers in, mm -hmm. the, in the in the, in the group. It was called Petronis, and I had a date with one of them, and. Uh, I arranged it prior, you know, and I, I told her I'll meet you on when you uh, when you go to the bus stop, and uh, 
as soon as she sees you, you know, off comes the hat and off comes the gloves, you know, and <laughs> then it comes off the socks, you know, the silk stockings and everything, you know, in the purse. And then we would leave that stuff in the back room at the Patroni's in mm -hmm. Beer Joint, and the tavern deal. It was nice, and, and they would uh, let you put them in their back room or their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, I didn't have a lot of money, you know, yeah. a, a couple of bucks, but the town was crawling with GIs. Mm -hmm. They came in from uh, being on uh, uh, Bivrac out, out in, in, in the outer part of Tennessee, mm -hmm. and the town would be crawling. But they also on Saturday had the uh, Grand Ole Opry, and that was a big deal too. And uh, they had this guy whose name was, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, he was a, a well-known country country guy, his mm -hmm. name was, what the hell was it? But his car was all designed up mm -hmm. real fancy. And if he was waiting at the belt, uh, bus stop, he always stopped to pick you up. His name was, what the hell was it? Well, that's that important. Yeah. But he was a real nice guy. Now, when you were there and you go into town in Nashville and that kind of thing, did you notice that it was a segregated society, that the blacks were treated differently from the whites, or did that not even occur to you there? We never saw any blacks. Okay. No, there wasn't a black in in the uh, ASD. Um, uh, yeah, but, I mean, but in the, among the civilian population, though, when you're going off base into town, that kind of thing. No, no. Okay. Uh, on Saturday, it was a big deal for the Grand Ole Opry, mm -hmm. and these people from the out areas would come to town mm -hmm. in an open truck, like a big yep. steak rack truck, and they'd be all standing up in the back of it, you know, and there'd be carloads of them, and then uh, they would line up for to get in for the doings at, at night, mm -hmm. and they would picnic on the, on the sidewalk, and they'd have spread out a... Uh, tablecloth and, and it always had a basket full of food and everything. And, and that was the, the way, it, every Saturday was that way. So it, several blocks were just covered by people waiting to get into the Grand Ole Opry. I never went, but I, I looked inside to see what it looked mm -hmm. like. And, and they had great big round things like that that held the balcony up, you know. Mm -hmm. If you ever got behind one of those, you're not going to see anything. <laughs> it was an old, old building. And, mm -hmm. uh, but it was the capital of Tennessee, right. you know? so we'd go around the Capitol building, and and it, you couldn't get into the theater. Mm -hmm. If you was lucky, you, you might get in, uh, and we'd go to the show or something. But uh, it was buy an ice cream cone or something, you know, and it, it was mostly you know, that kind of a thing. It was no big deal. But, right. uh, <laughs> I shouldn't tell you this, but the the uh, gals that were uh, the, the gals from that were going to uh, Vanderbilt, they were uh, they were had sorority houses all, all around, and they always were asking us to buy them. Uh, 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 it was uh, Coke and what, what do they put in a Coke? Uh, the rum. Rum. Not, yeah. Rum, yeah. And we could buy it, but they they, they couldn't. And so they always guess we'd have to buy that buy them rum. They, they they could have they had a coke machine mm -hmm. in their place, you know. And they had a lady that run the show, you know. But and then they could I'm drinking a coke, you know, mm -hmm. but they spiked it with its rum. Right. And uh, so they always would be after us to buy them a buy them rum. So that's how we got acquainted on it. Mm -hmm. And they'd drop a line down from the window up sticking for them. We'd tie the bag on it. And, but... <laughs> okay, it's not, not a bad way to spend very probably. I had a nice lady, our girlfriend, and, and she was a, she was a uh, uh, southern gal, real southern. She was from Mississippi, mm -hmm. Sanford, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Very nice gal. And uh, we uh, got along real, real well, in fact. One every time it got at Christmas time, they always shut down the school and everything, and we went on furlough. And she invited me down to meet her, her, her dad, mm -hmm. her, her father. 
he owned Sanford. Okay. The, the town was named after Sanford, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. She wanted me to come down to me, and I said, no. A, a Yankee down in that country, would shoot, I get shot. <laughs> and uh, no, no, I, and so I didn't go, but I was invited. And she was a nice gal. She, she used to sneak out. We had a, the room that I was in, I had the fire escape. And while we was on the third floor, on the end of the deal, and there was four of us in the room. And, uh, but it had one window that access to the fire escape and after bed check and uh, you couldn't get no sleep the damn activity wasn't going in the <laughs> damn, damn bit down at the bed. Well I used it a few times myself and uh, what we would do is go over and get them and they'd crawl out the window and, and and we'd go down to the stadium the football stadium and we'd crawl up in a football stadium and, We'd, we'd sit up there and neck and, you know, talk, mm -hmm. you know. It was real nice. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was not all, you know, uh, uh, bad, bad, you sure. know, army stuff, you know. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, now, so let's see, is it, you get sort of late in 1944, an hour in the fall sometime, that you shut down the program? Yeah, well, a bunch of us, and so it was quite a group. We're shipped to the 106th Infantry Division in uh, uh, Terre Haute, Indiana. Okay. Uh, the Camp Terre Haute, Indiana, in Terre Haute, and there were Camp, uh, Camp Atterbury. Okay. Camp Atterbury. And uh, I was put in a rifle platoon, a 422nd Regiment, uh, in uh, this 106th Division. Mm -hmm. I didn't last a week. And all the guys that came from ASDP, they jerked us all out. Mm -hmm. They put us on KP. And I spent all the rest of the time I was at Canterbury, Canterbury and KP. And that must have been for three, four weeks because mm -hmm. I got one uh, weekend pass and I got in to go to Indianapolis. I can remember that. But after uh, a while, we jerked everybody out of the cave that was on KP, that, that was ASDP, and they shipped us to uh, Camp Crowder, Missouri, that was in Joplin. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't do nothing there, we, they just put us in a barracks. Uh, it was a barracks uh, two-story job, had inside plumbing and everything, and we didn't have it like it was in basic training. And it was at one of the big mess halls where you went through the the chow line with a tray, and uh, we didn't do nothing. We, we just uh, played baseball or whatever we could do, you know, and crowds around the camp, you know, and we went down, met the wax down in the wax area, and and we didn't do anything. And it was that went on for oh god, it must have been almost a month. But they was, all the time there was more coming in all the time, and uh, once they got everybody. They wanted, I guess. They put us all on a train and they shipped us down to uh, Camp Rucker, Alabama. And uh, we all went into this 1153rd Engineering, Combat Engineer uh, Group. And they split us all up. Some went to uh, Treadway Bridge Company, some went to Line Company, some went to Light Equipment Companies. I was put into uh, the Headquarters Company. And I was uh, supposed to be a driver, messenger, that was my uh, designation. And I drove for a captain, uh, and he was the S-4 in the s s staff officers. These were, it was run by a, a full colonel, and uh, he didn't like me. Uh, he, I think, he knew that I was an ASTP guy, and he, he, he figured I was a goof off that you know, I had hats off going for quite a while, but how he just picked me out, I don't know, but he did. But I'll tell you a little bit more later. And he picked on me, I thought, but it was all right. Uh, but I drove, and they gave me an old beat up uh, staff car, it was a half uh, ton staff car. Uh, four-wheel drive and everything. 
but they didn't teach it or anything. You know, there it is. I, I said, well, where, where did you check the oil? Uh, lift the hood up, you know. And, and so you, they didn't tell you nothing. You know. So you just, you just drove it, you know. And the only thing they ever told you is when, when we're on the highway, when we're going someplace, don't go like this, you know. I mean, speed up and slow down, speed up. Mm -hmm. Steady speed, keep it, keep it closed up. And uh, that was the only thing they ever told us. But uh, in order to be a, a good driver, you had to be able to read maps. You had to be, in other words, to be good. Mm -hmm. In other words, the officer could tell you, you know, we want to go someplace, and they 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 do the map reading, and they tell you, you know, this mm -hmm. is where we want to go. And, you know. But it, if you're a good one, you do that, and and you tell them where you're going to go, and. Uh, so that's what I was, other driver. And that was only because when I worked for this dairy where I was shoveling ice cream, my mm -hmm. moving up, uh, I got to be a, uh, what they call a special delivery uh, drive over the truck that I went around when they had special deliveries to stores mm -hmm. and spaces. And I got 20 cents an hour instead of shoveling ice cream, I, I drove special delivery. Well, that was in my resume for okay. the deal when I in that I had drove this this truck, and I used to drive my dad's milk truck to him, but only when he would be down the block a bit, you know, when yeah. I drive up to him, you know. But, but uh, so I had driven before, and uh, now where the hell are we? Well, uh, how did you you mentioned that the, the colonel didn't like you? How, did you get along with the captain? Oh yeah, oh yeah, the captain was great. He was a, I'll just tell you about him. His name was Captain Jack. His name was Jack Saunders. He was a, a, a big land, or a big contractor from Oklahoma. I mean, he, he was big time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we got to know each other really. I was like a son to him, really I was. Uh, and he was not militarily at all. He he uh, he he'd wave to you, you know. And only time he ever showed any military uh, 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 things was when he had to. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, his, so he was Captain Jack, and he was re he was really really great. But we had another one that was great too. But he came later out of the TDs. He was a tank destroyer outfit, but uh, they just they did. Banded that they didn't get uh, they didn't have any taking any stores in my and he was a first lieutenant and he was uh, uh, a uh, Mexican in descent mm -hmm. and his name was Hernandez and we called him Pancho his name was Walter Hernandez burly guy and you wouldn't want to tangle with him at all and he, he he was always looking for a fight well anyway he was a nice guy too. Well, anyway, this Captain uh, Captain Jack, he was real nice guy, and uh, uh, but th this colonel had it in for me. Mm -hmm. I was in the headquarters company one, just to show you what how picayune he was. I was sitting on a stool, uh, and, and he walked in, and he saw my socks because my my, my pants must have out a little bit because I was sitting on a stool. He saw my socks. He came over and he says, you're out of uniform. You know those socks, they need to go with this uniform. You're supposed to look a little bit, you know, about, about my socks. And I thought, what the hell is this about socks? But apparently I had the wrong kind of socks on. And he chewed me out about my about the socks. And they had to go get my right socks on. Well, the next time he chewed me out was uh, the, uh, was on a Saturday, and he was reviewing the troops on the uh, parade grounds. And as they passed the reviewing stand, I always wore my helmet liner kind of a cock that wasn't down on my eyelids like this, you know. He noticed that out of the whole damn outfit, you know, and, and he puts so he, he picks me out and he gets back at, at when he can see me, you know, and he says. You wear your helmet, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. But how the hell he picked me out of all those guys? But I'll tell you when I got back at him. But that's down the road. Okay. But anyway, uh, this Captain Jack was real good, and uh, I have to tell you this because 
one day we, he, he uh, uh, wanted me to go to the officers' uh, quarters where they were uh, housed. And his wife and his little girl, a, a daughter, was there to, to visit him. So I met his wife and his little girl. And his wife came over to see me on, on, a, on a QT. She says, I want you to take good care of Jack. I want you to see that you take good and that he gets back to me. Mm -hmm. think, Here I am a buck private, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'll do my best, ma'am. I'll, I'll see that I do everything I can to get him back to you. And I promised her that, mm -hmm. you know. He didn't make it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's sad, but that's, you know, I made the promise, but I couldn't keep it. Okay. Because I had no control. Right. You know, I, I didn't know what the hell, they, you know, whether it sounded good or Well, anyway, that was a very s sad situation. But to make a long story short, we uh, did a lot of training, particularly uh, that I was in. We'd go to uh, different, uh, this one river, and I forget the name of it, Callahassee or... It was a pretty good sized river, mm -hmm. and they did a lot of uh, bridge work mm -hmm. where they would bridge across this Tallahassee River, oh. and uh, the they would prepare the uh, approaches, you know, and, and, and do that whole thing for it to, to cross. And that's what the training was, to, to build those treadway bridges. Mm -hmm. And then they built, the line companies built... Um, uh, Bailey bridges and, and they did mine detection and all that kind of stuff and then uh, once in a while uh, when they we would be on bivouac out in the field and that was once in a while uh, uh, the captain had let me uh, uh, get on a bulldozer or a line or a road grader or whatever you know and I'd try my hand at it mm -hmm. and, and it was fun you know but I was just screwing around. Mm -hmm. But he, you know, he'd just tell me, let, let, let me try, you know. And so it, it, it was, I got into it. But I, I took care of him real good, you know. I mean, when we were out bibbing whacking and everything, I'd seen that he got a place to sleep and, and that he got a, his, he, he had a, a mattress kind of a thing that he had for, that we didn't have. But I, I looked after him. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when the, we we had uh, long marches and we had uh, uh, we went to the rifle range and everything, but the same old crap, you know. It was nothing that was modern, and uh, uh, we uh, ended up uh, in the training. In that picture that I showed you, yeah. uh, that was just before we went to uh, what did I, we uh, that was just before we shipped out to uh, Fort Dix in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And that was just, we waited there, and we was there probably for two weeks maybe, waiting for a ship. Okay. And then when did you ship out? When do you leave the States? The date? Yeah, roughly. It was on that, that probably that deal there, that, that uh, little, what do you call it? But it was in, uh, it was in the, we, we ended in uh, Europe in September. So we must have looked, it took us a, I don't remember whether it was nine days or 13 that it took us to go I, I, across. I think the discharge paper said you got to Europe in October, but... That's... No, it was in September. Okay, okay. you might have left September. 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 And uh, we landed in uh, Liverpool. Okay. In... Well, what, what kind of ship were you on? <laughs> I don't know. Well, it was a troop ship. Okay. I, let me tell you this. Uh, the day we shipped out of Fort Dix, they put us on a bus. And we we went to New York, and it went down in the docks, and we went in this warehouse on the docks. And it was a big warehouse, and the buses drove in and everything, and we unloaded in this warehouse, and they had a, a big opening, and we walked across the docks, and there was another big opening, and that other big opening was the ship. Mm -hmm. We didn't get to see what it was, looked like or anything. It was just, it was just a big black hole, you know, yeah. that, that, that we walked across in. And when we got in there, it, all it was was a bunch of iron pipes going through the ceiling with a canvas between them. And they went up about maybe um, about maybe 10 or 12 
uh, 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 these canvas uh, things that we use for a bed, mm -hmm. and it was just solid like that, you know, very narrow space in between, and uh, uh, that's where you, where you were, and it, you, there was very little room for you to do anything, and the, the lighting was very, very poor. You couldn't read or anything, and so you pretty much was confined to just that canvas uh, bunk that they yeah. had. But uh, they had uh, showers, but you had to use, it was salt water. So you tried it, but then you all end up with all salt, you know, all over this, so that was out. But you did use them, use it to brush your yeah. teeth, you know. And uh, uh, so I always selected a bunk that was up at the top, because otherwise you had everybody climbing up and, uh, uh, on your bunk, going up to the higher, higher uh, bunks. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, it was, the best thing about it was KP. Oh, yeah, that was the best. And uh, we got two meals a day, and your your meal time was like uh, you never knew whether it was day or night or what it was. But any time uh, eight came around, if that was your time, that was your meal time. In other words, whether it was eight at night or whether it was eight in the morning, that that was it. Uh, and so uh, then you got out of the. The hole, which is that's where you were down in the hole of the ship, and you went to the uh, uh, the mess hall or the place they had, and you you uh, had a tin tray or a metal tray, and you went through the chow line, and uh, that then you stood up. You you didn't sit down. They had uh, a little place about maybe a foot wide that you could set your tray on. It was about waist high. And then you just had enough to squeeze in and, and stand, uh, and, and you had about 15, 20 minutes to eat, and then mm -hmm. you get you out. But that was it. So the only time you got out of the uh, the hole down there was it, when you got on KP, and they, they they used a lot of KPs because it was a 24-hour mm -hmm. deal. And, and so uh, if you got on KP, that was good because you got a chance to go out on deck, mm -hmm. and they had uh, these hoppers that was on the rail of the ship. The great big hoppers where you dumped the garbage and all the trash and everything. And then at night, when they were, they would dump the trash uh, at night. Uh, and so, but between the uh, entrance of the uh, mess hall there, that. And you could walk across the deck to this, these hoppers where you dumped the garbage. You get a chance, you could look around a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and you could see, uh, you know, the other ships. Okay. And, and so you were sailing a convoy. Yeah, well, there was it was a big convoy, and you could see the destroyers right. roaring around, you know, and they they jerking, dirting around, and, but you you dilly dally i'll tell you 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 took you forever to dump that garbage and, <laughs> and everything and then you got a breath of fresh air you yeah. know and it was good and uh, so that was that was really precious the, the, the fact that you could get out but you never got a chance to, to look up and see what the ship looked like or anything you, you didn't know i mean it, we, all you'd seen was just that little bit that you went from between the mess hall door and and, and the garbage yeah. now was the weather good when you went across uh, yeah, it was okay, good. So people were not, not a lot of people were getting sick. Well, or? we didn't know whether it was raining or, okay. you know, what the deal was, but when we got to Liverpool, it was nice. Okay. And uh, um, we, we got off uh, at Liverpool and the uh, uh, British, I, I guess you'd call it Red Cross or something, met us and they, uh, they had cookies for us and, of course, <laughs> they have tea, but... <laughs> but they put us on a on a train right away, a British train. Mm -hmm. uh, you know how they work. Uh, you, you know they had the doors on the right. side, and compartments, you compartments yeah. and deal. And we shipped down to the southernmost part of England. That was down to Colburn. It was a uh, they called it a holiday city or town where they would spend vacations. And it was down on the. Uh, on the coast, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, 
Was it Brighton or someplace it, it, like that? Uh, it was called uh, Torquay. Okay. Torquay. Okay. And uh, we ended up on, it was up on a hill kind of in, uh, it was a probably a, a kind of an estate thing, mm -hmm. it was a big house and uh, a, a courtyard and a fence around it and we had these corrugated Quonset huts and the officers and everything, they lived in the big house and we ate in the big house, they had the mess hall that was in the big house. So all there was was a, they had a latrine which was a, a Quonset hut and then he had about about four or five uh, of these metal Quonset huts. And now, we, was it just your company there, or was the whole group there? Just, just the company. Okay. Just the headquarters company. And then they they began to outfit us. Uh, we got new trucks. I got a new a staff car. It was a quarter, three quarter ton, nice new, brand new. And they gave us uh, M1 carbines steel helmets and, and uh, uh, winter clothes and, and everything, we, they all fit us. But I didn't spend much time in Turkey. Mm -hmm. I, right. I was gone 90% of the time. Uh, I, uh, this captain that I was working with, uh, he worked out of London and uh, he worked on uh, Oxford Street. It used to be the uh, uh, it was a department store. Yeah, there were big tailors and things on Oxford Street or big stores. It, it was a white building. Uh, what the hell was the name of it? See, my memory's not good, but uh, Sparks and Marks, and okay. I think was the name of it. And it was on the second floor. Uh, we went back there in, in 19. Uh, the wife and I went back on the 50th anniversary mm -hmm. of the of the uh, war, and we and we went. And I showed her where mm -hmm. I used to work. And it was on the second, but it was then it was the pet department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, uh, I was uh, uh, there in London a lot, and I stayed in a place. They they had what they called uh, uh, yeah. I had to stop. They. Uh, uh, had this uh, uh, for trances, and uh, it was run by the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. And I was there so much; I had a room that was there. It was in, on uh, it was uh, uh, on Cognaton Square. It was like an old uh, apartment house mm -hmm. or something like. That. And uh, but if you were a transit, that's where you you stayed and you right. ate and everything. So that's where I did. But this was a buzz bomb days and uh, it, complete blackout, you know. So at night you. Uh, oh, you could just answer, I suppose. You no, know, I'm going to just leave it down. Okay. Uh, it, uh, the, uh, uh, the buzz bombs were very low flying mm -hmm. and they were just for harassment. But the uh, populace, they would, most of them would. Spend the nights in the underground and where the mm -hmm. underground trains were. I never did, but uh, I uh, just took my, you know, I, st I stayed up. But y you couldn't go out at night because you get lost. Mm -hmm. it, it was that dark. I mean, uh, when you went in any place, uh, they had a door you go in, and, but then they had a, a, a curtained off little ante room like. So then you go into there where this little ante room is, and you close the door and everything. So there was there was no light that it was uh, exposed to it. Mm -hmm. So night was out. So you, you only could uh, navigate the place in, in the daylight. Mm -hmm. But we were right across from uh, this Cardinal Square. It was uh, uh, Hyde Park. It was right across the street, mm -hmm. and they had uh, the anti-aircraft guns and, and stuff there in there, and they had a lot of women on their batteries, uh, gun crews, and they used to go across the street mm -hmm. and talk to the gals on the gun on the gun crews. And they were nice, and uh, but uh, I got to know London pretty pretty well because I spent a lot of time there. Well, what we did, and then I'll get on to it, was. Uh, they don't tell me this, but I 
over here in the conversations and there was no partition between <laughs> the driver and the, and the officers. What the deal was, was it was a preparation for the uh, uh, bridging of the Rhine River. Mm -hmm. And this was, this was all in the making up. So we would go to a, a naval base, you know, and I would, what the heck are we doing this naval base for, you know? Well, they're there for, to make arrangements for the LCMs and, and the people that are going to man them and, and get them up to uh, where they were supposed to get them in Germany on the Albert Canal. Then we would go to, the air, uh, to an air base and we'd be there several times, you know. Well, that's to arrange for the airdrop and the barrageable or the... Uh, barrage balloons? The, yeah, the uh, barrage balloons and all that kind of stuff, you know, but it, it comes out and, you know, you know pretty, pretty soon you can put it together, you know, what's going on. Then some days we would go to line companies, you know, that were the ones that were going to put in the bridges and stuff, but went all over, so I mm -hmm. was I was over. And sometimes we'd go several times to the same place. But it was it was interesting, and of course, in London, you know, it's, it's fog. Mm -hmm. And we were there when, it, it just like dropping a white sheet over the windshield, you know, and it didn't make no difference whether it was foggy or wasn't. But, and then, of course, you're driving on the wrong side of the road. Mm -hmm. And if you was on an American base, you you drove on the right side. And if you was on the English roads, you drove on the left side. So, so sometimes I'd screw up and, and get on the wrong side of the road. But it was it was that kind of a deal. And. Uh, once in a while, we would get a one of those. Uh, what do they call them? Them uh, uh, the ones that flew real high and silent. Uh, the B two. B twos, yes. And they they would come down. Ooh. I mean that really. It picked that uh, staff car right off the, lot of the ground and brought it like that. And silent. You didn't hear them coming or anything. And boom. And I, uh, that was the biggest thing. I mean, I was scared to death of those, but mm -hmm. uh, the, the buzz bombs, you just hoped that they kept going because mm -hmm. when they ran out of fuel, psh, down they came. And, uh, you just hoped that they kept on going. The gun crews never shot at them or anything. Mm -hmm. They just hoped the same thing, you know, and they kept on going. And uh, so that was, I spent a lot of time in London. So but how long did you spend in England then? Uh, then we shipped out. Uh, let's see, it was right after Christmas, okay. and uh, it was a very hurried up proposition. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, we're shipping out, and uh, Southampton was just a stone's throw from where we were, and we crossed uh, the uh, um, channel mm -hmm. uh, at night mm -hmm. in, in an LST, and uh, half of the uh, Cargo was tanks. We, they were all chained down, and, and then the other half was our outfit. And I was the second vehicle on the when you unload, mm -hmm. where the doors went down. I was the second vehicle, and uh, uh, they're very Spartan. Uh, you don't have nothing, no place to sleep or anything, you know. So you make the best you can. And they had a few uh, canvas cots if you was lucky enough to get one, but. It was such a rough crossing. We had a real bad crossing uh, that it, it, if you did get one of those canvas scripts, it would slide when it did, and then it'd slide back, and then it'd get filled over, you know. So you, you give up and you, you, you just sleep wherever you could find underneath you know, the vehicle or wherever, you know. Well, uh, some of the tanks broke loose from the chains that were in the hole, and, and they were bouncing around down there and everything. but. We, we landed in La Havre early in the morning. I, it was getting daybreak. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was the second vehicle off the, off the uh, LST. When you say, you know, that they land on the beach, nah, that ain't the case at all. They open the doors and they bring the door down to the level of the water. So they can be five feet of water at the end of it. And so 
you, you don't go off the thing like slow like and dip, dip down in the water. You try to fly off mm -hmm. and float to the ground or the beach. <laughs> so I was the second one, and the captain told me, he says, well, put it in four-wheel drive, and he says, uh, go as fast as you can in the, I only had one car length to get where I was going to go. And so I, I give it all up ahead, you know, and we flew off the damn end of the thing and we, we made it. Well, as soon as I hit the beach, uh, there was another guy, he was an Emmys driver, his name was Don Bear. Uh, we were told to go to uh, uh, Shape in Paris. Mm -hmm. That's the Supreme Allied Forces yeah. Headquarters. Right. That was in, in Paris. That's mm -hmm. where Eisenhower right. was and all the right. big shots. So we took off right away uh, for Paris. And the rest of them, they hadn't even got off the, off the ship yet. And we left, left for Paris, the two of us. And it took us all day to get there. We didn't get there until it was Getting to, it was dark when we got there. What what made it so slow? It was just small well, bad roads. It's, it's a you know it's it's like it's not no expressway or anything. Yeah. You know? And yeah. then we had to follow the you know the Paris signs you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a long ways. And then when we got there. We had to find us an MP or somebody to tell us where the hell this mm -hmm. uh, headquarters was. And then we we found it, and the place was closed. But they had a guard mm -hmm. there, you know. And so we told him what we was there for, and we wanted to see somebody. And he took us in, and uh, he went and back and got the officer of the day. And he came out, and uh, we went over to his desk. And who the hell do you think it was? It was James Roosevelt. It was it was the Roosevelt. Uh, it was the president's son, mm -hmm. Jimmy. James Rose, he had his nameplate on his desk. Right, and we're going uh, to pause right here because this tape is about up. So you get a break for a moment. Okay, so we had gotten you into Paris at the very end of 1944. You get to the Allied headquarters and you're introduced to one James Roosevelt. He gave us our orders that I was sent there to get for where we was supposed to go, mm -hmm. the outfit. Well, uh, it was it was dark then, it was at night, and uh, it was past supper time and we hadn't had anything to eat uh, other than K rations. And so we had a big decision to make. Uh, should we ask this guard where we could get some, get dinner, some hot meal here, these people? These MPs and stuff, they must eat someplace. Mm -hmm. But we discussed it and we thought, no, that's not fair. The, the guys back out there, they're eating K rations, so we, this wouldn't be fair. And we should get back there as soon as we can. So we got back to uh, the beach in La Havre in the morning. Mm -hmm. And they were they all gone. They were all gone. And so we just took the road that uh, led off the beach. And, and we bumped into them down, down the roadways, and they were waiting for us. Mm -hmm. And they didn't move until we, we gave them the orders. And uh, then we moved uh, that day up into Luxembourg. And uh, we spent the night in a town in Luxembourg. Well, of course, in, in the town we, we, we crowded around a little bit. Well, it was pretty close where we was. They had one of these uh, uh, spas where they had hot water mm -hmm. uh, come out of the ground or something, whatever. You know. And so, <laughs> with a few cigarettes, we we had a hot bath in this spa, in big copper tubs, and then they didn't have running water. The mm -hmm. ladies they bring it in buckets and dump it in there, but they'd scrub your back if you ask them, you know. So we got a, a good, good, nice bath in there in, in, in Luxembourg. Okay. Now the Battle of the Bulge had been going on in the previous couple yeah, of weeks. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's where we were headed. Yeah. Well, then we, as we moved north, we moved into uh, Belgium, mm -hmm. and as we further as we further we got north, the worse the weather got, you know. And as we got closer to the front, we only moved at night. 
Well, the snow got real bad, and uh, we was wallowing in the snow. And even the big trucks, because there's no snow plows or anything, they was plowing snow all the crap to the damn windshield, you know, and they couldn't even see, you know, so they had to stop. And, and, and so it got to the, we had to order them to put their chains on. And we had chains, mm -hmm. and they put chains on, even on four-wheel drive. And those, uh, some of them were, you know, with those six buys, they had uh, big tools in the back. They, they, they were big trucks. Well, anyway, I was usually what they called on advanced uh, 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 advanced uh, uh, well I, I, went, I always went ahead right advanced uh, uh, outlook or advanced mm -hmm. patrol or yeah. whatever that advanced uh, well anyway it was a uh, an officer and a guy running shotgun and, and, and a driver and so we always went ahead of the of the convoy and all the true everything to see that everything the road is is the road you're supposed to be on and uh, that uh, it's passable and there's no uh, uh, gunfire no you know you have no problem or anything so it was always on advanced uh, patrol yeah and I music was was on it most of the time and uh, so I was pretty much in the know where we were going and everything. Because they had to tell me, tell you, you know. And then the guys would always ask you, you know, where are we going, where are we going? Or, you know, they always got scuttlebutt, you know. And I thought, oh, you're going to, you're going to the bulbs. Well, that's where we ended up. We ended up in Malmody. Mm -hmm. That's where the order said that we was mm -hmm. to report. Well, Malmody was all shot up and banged and, and all, it was just a bunch of rubble. And the snow was, was really bad, and the weather was terrible. It was freezing, and uh, you know what the main thing is, is: how do we survive? You know, I mean, we, it, that's the main thing. We don't worry about the Germans or anything. Mm -hmm. We were worried about how we was going to survive. So everybody, you know, crawls around and trying to find a place where they can get out of the weather. And they dig around in the rubble trying to find a a cellar or some place where they could, you know, get in and crawl in. And so everybody goes on your own, you know. And uh, I found this in several, a lot of the guys, it was kind of, it must have been a, a gymnasium or so. It wasn't a theater because there was no theater seats mm -hmm. in it. And it was a pretty big room, but the roof was all blown off in the middle. Mm -hmm. And there was snow in the middle of it, but all around the edge was uh, a bare space of mm -hmm. about six or eight feet. And that, that was all we needed was to get out of the snow, so all the guys would uh, bunk down or try to sleep around the edge of that, that building. And so uh, that's where I, I, I spent my time, most of it, in, when I was in Malmody in that there. But, uh, we we stood guard duty at night and everything, and and then we operated during the daytime, and our our area of responsibility was from Melmody to Saint Vith, mm -hmm. and uh, you probably heard of the Melmody massacre, yes. haven't you? Well, th that was what they call tri corners. Three roads came mm -hmm. together there, in this field, and I would drive by it maybe. Uh, um, three, four times a day sometimes, you know. And all I would see then was because there was so much snow was the mounds. Mm -hmm. Every place where there was a body, there was a mound. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the thing it got out of hand, it, pretty soon it was that there were 300 guys that got shot there. You know? And then the 350. You know? mm -hmm. And all the scuttlebutt, you know, that uh, went around amongst the troops, you know. They never seen it, but mm -hmm. that was scuttlebutt that passed along. So everybody said, oh, I'm not going to be taken prisoner. Ah, oh, no, no, you know, and things kind of stiffened, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, uh, uh, the, the main, what, what, what the thing was, is we were put into what they call, we were uh, uh, infantry. In other words, uh, we weren't combat engineers anymore, we were infantry, and that's what we were. Well, uh, 
I, I just did what I was supposed to do, you know. I, I, the, the thing that bothered me the most was these infiltrators, these Germans that were in U American uniforms. That was a real, real mess. That was bad. Well, they had used those at the start of the bulge, but that would have been several weeks before you got there. Uh, were there any it was there. Oh, yes. Okay. Anybody you encountered, it was uh, on your, you had your finger on the trigger, and uh, it was this. They had a password, you know, and a mm -hmm. countersign and all that, but it never got around, you know. Maybe the mm -hmm. countersign and the password was three days old, you know, mm -hmm. when, by that time you got it. So it was a matter of. Uh, uh, who's Betty Grable? Uh, where are you from? Uh, I'm from M M Michigan. Who's the t who's 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 the ball team? The, the Michigan uh, or the National League uh, team for Michigan? Detroit Tigers, you know. You, you know but they knew more about uh, the United States than you did, you know. But they'd all lived in the United States, you know, and they knew all that and. So it was really touch and go. It wasn't good at all, uh, and uh, they screwed up all of the signs that, mm -hmm. that told you know what road you're on. Well, did and you actually encounter any of that specifically, or did you just hear about it? What the, Ger the Germans doing all this stuff? Oh no, 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 hell no! They was oh, we'd encounter them all the time. Yeah, uh, that, that was why you know you, you never knew. You know that, that you maybe just let a bunch of half a dozen Germans just walk by you know you know they had all the answers you know and everything but uh, it was it was very uh, you know I mean stressful mm -hmm. I mean nobody trusted anybody and uh, they was probably eating your chow you know in the same same place that was the way it was mm -hmm. but uh, uh, the you... first time I got to the front this mm -hmm. is where the the action was. Mm -hmm was in St. Biff, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we drove up to St. Biff, and the officers, they went into a house or something there, but there was a GI walking behind a, uh, it was a stone wall, he was walking back and forth, he tried to keep warm, you know, and uh, I was, uh, I see him down walking down there, and I, I thought, well, I'm going to go down and talk to him, you know, so I went down to talk to him. He gave me an education. I, I, that was the best information I got. Uh, I walked down there and he says, uh, don't you know that uh, when you get out of a staff car like that, that you're prime uh, uh, bait for some sniper to pick you off? And he says, that coat you're wearing too, he says, I you think you're an officer. Where did you get that coat? And I says, oh, the captain gave a, a, a couple of bottles of scotch for, for a couple of those. Those have, that's a uh, uh, severe weather coat, navy coat. Holy crazy, that's a nice coat. He said, but you'll get rid of it. He says, they'll, they'll pick you off. And he says, you've never been here at the front before? And I said, no. I said, oh, we've only been here. We got here a couple of days ago. And he says, well, he says, get rid of that coat. And he says, when, when don't get out of when you get out of that staff car. He says, stay out of it, behind it. He says, don't don't expose yourself. And I I, I talked to him you know, and I says, well, where bombs are the German? He says, on the other side of the wall. They're trying to keep warm too. And uh, I said, that's why you're walking back. And he says, yeah. He said, I'm trying to keep warm. He says, I'm supposed to be on guard duty here. But he gave me all this good advice, you know. And so, so I remembered that, but the coat I wasn't going to part with. It had a nice big, it was all fur lined inside, you know, and, and uh, but I disguised it with the scarf and, and everything. So, but uh, he, he was a, a very, he'd been here a while, he knew what the scoop was, but I didn't know. But that was my conversation with the guy in St. Louis. But they were, they got the Germans around the other side of the wall. They got, you know, they were trying to keep warm too. Well, uh, they say that Patton, uh, you know, when he 
relieve Bastogne, you know, that was the big deal. Well, it was big, but really what uh, changed the whole situation as far as I was concerned, what I thought, the sun came out, good weather, mm -hmm. sunshine, you know. The Air Force was back in business. And boy, did they give them hell with, and, uh, and they just, mm -hmm. th those tanks and everything, you know, they just bound hell out of them and everything, and then the Germans turned and headed back to Germany. Mm -hmm. And But that was, in my opinion, it was the Air Force that turned the tide. Um, yeah. It certainly wasn't because I was there, that's for damn sure. Well, by the time you got there, I mean, they had already been stopped and were being pushed back. I mean, you couldn't have gotten to Malmedy or San Vito within the first week or so of that fight. No, no, yeah. no. no. They, they, the Germans had been in Malmedy. Yes, and, and well and, beyond and, it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. And and then they ousted them and mm -hmm. it was pushed them back. Okay. But, but so we was in Malmedy as a... a where the headquarters was. Right. Now you said that you were being at that point just kind of used as infantry. Now did you actually go in to fight as infantry or did things change a little bit and they put you back to being engineers? No, we just stayed as what we were. We just had, all I had was an M1 uh, uh, carbine. carbine and a few grenades that were under the seat of the, the vehicle that I had. That's all I had. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, um, <laughs> it's not very good with a tank. I had no bazooka or anything in them, but that was it. And uh, uh, fortunately, uh, the sun came out and things got well in a hurry, you know, because then Patton uh, took care of the Bastoon deal. But Bastoon was quite a ways from Melody. Yeah, yeah. That was not close at all. But. We just operated between St. Vincent and Malmody. Mm -hmm. That was our operation earlier. And we, it wasn't just our headquarters company, it was the whole 1153rd right. and all these other outfits. Right. You know, they, but where they ended up, I don't know. Mm -hmm. the, the, the brass knew, you know, where they were. So about how long did you stay in that area? Oh, I'd say a month or so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then when things, uh, they pushed the Germans out, and pushed, they were mm -hmm. going back to Germany. Right. And the the Balls deal was was over. Uh, we thought we were going to go up into Hergen Forest. Mm -hmm. That's where the next uh, battle was. Was Hergen Forest. And so when we uh, packed up to, to move, uh, it wasn't Hergen Forest at all. We went to Holland. Mm -hmm. they, they they swung us north into Holland, and we ended up in a town called Sittard, and it's right across from Maastricht. Mm -hmm. But the Albert Canal it, it goes between the two, and uh, uh, we we uh, was uh, housed in a schoolhouse in Sittard. We sit there for quite a while, and we wondered what the hell was going on, and well. Uh, we was waiting for the LCMs to come up through the Albert Canal to uh, Maastricht there, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we were waiting for. Well, when they got there, then uh, our outfit, they, they had tank retrievers that sucked these LCMs out of the Albert Canal onto these tank retrievers, and there must have been... 1520 of these LCMs, and then they got them out of the out of the canal lineup, and then, and this was the, the captain, this Captain Hernandez, and I, we had the job of getting them to the uh, 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 Rhine River, and we had to wait for a while because they had the Ruhr River to get across, and, and, and so we we had to wait until the line, or the battle line moved. Uh, up to the Rhine, but, but when they got up to the Rhine, why then we we followed along. But the towns were built right on the edge of the road, so and the roads were very narrow, and these big heavy things were like moving a house, so it was very difficult. And we had a uh, a, a crew that had chainsaws, and they had uh, we had some. Uh, uh, explosives guys that blew up stuff 
and a couple of dozers and everything. And so we would reconnoiter a route. And we'd go on, maybe we'd detour way off just so we wouldn't have to blow up a town or whatever, or a village. And, but some places it was just a matter of, well, this is all we got to, we're going to have to do, uh, blow something up. So they would take a side of this little village or something and they'd charge it up and they'd blow it all down. And then the dozers would go in and, and push it all aside so we could get through. And trees and everything, you know, they would mm -hmm. saw down with ch chainsaws. And they, so it took us some doing to get up to the Land River. Well, when we got there, uh, they all had them lined up. And I drove right up to the to the Rhine River right, to, to see what it was, you know. And I looked at it and I thought, holy Christ, are they going to get across this? So that I looked, you know, and the houses looked like doll houses on the other side, you know. And the Rhine River is about like from here to Mona Lake. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, it's, a, it's a big river. Christ, they have big, big boats on that damn thing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, holy Christ, this, this is not going to be easy. This is going to be big time, you know. Well, while I was standing there, uh, dumbfounded, you know, bang, uh, it, a sniper took a shot at me from across the river, and it hit the bumper of my, uh, my uh, command car, mm -hmm. it, right in the bumper, about a foot away from me to the left of me. And, uh, holy Christ, I forgot uh, about what that guy told me, you know. Mm -hmm. So I got I got the hell out of there behind there then, but they were shooting from all the way across the damn Rhine River. Mm -hmm. so, so I <laughs> I was lucky, but that was the only time I was shot at. But uh, then we, uh, where I was, I, I don't know where the officers were, but they set up a headquarters company just out, out back away from the Rhine River, maybe a half a mile or something, where there was some houses or something. Mm -hmm. And I was at a, a farmhouse that, uh, that I was uh, uh, staying in, and uh, uh, I would go to uh, where the headquarters company was, where, where the mess hall, where, where we where we get food, and where, where we um, it, we ate. I was walking from where I was at this farmhouse uh, one morning, go, going to breakfast, and all I had was my mess kit in my hand and I was walking across this field, I saw the first jet I ever saw in my life. This German jet come mm -hmm. right over me. And he was photographing and checking the progress of, of the uh, uh, material and mm -hmm. stuff that was being accumulated for the crossing. But that was the first jet I ever saw. and. Uh, it, he just went right and all I had was my mess kit and I waved it at him. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was it. But uh, I thought they was going to cross the Rhine on my birthday. But actually it was the 24th of March and that they actually made the, the, the move. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, they brought up what they call, it's called a heavy ponton bridge. Mm -hmm. They have these cows and it's wood and planking and everything, but, but it's obsolete. But they use the scows for uh, the troops to get across and in the, uh, in the initial assault. Mm -hmm. Well, on the 24th, this was at night, it st all started at about 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. That The barrage started mm -hmm. and the artillery was all, was all along. And it was about a nine mile front that this was all taking place. Well, you only see just a little mm -hmm. segment, you know. Well, I, w I was wanted to see everything that was going on, you know, but it was that night, and you know, you didn't, you couldn't see much, you know. I, I went over when I was standing by a 105 howitzer that was, and the artillery batteries that was mm -hmm. shelling the uh, other side. And so I just watched them, you know, as it was, uh, operating. So I got to talking to one of the guys. I said, uh, let me take a shot at Hitler, will you? I said, I never I never had a shot at, uh, I only gave me a shot by damn t uh, M1 yet. So he let me pull the lanyard. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was waiting for morning. I thought, I would see what the hell's going on, you know. Couldn't see a damn thing. 
only thing I saw was the barrage balloons. Mm -hmm. I saw those that were up. It was all smoke, white smoke, everything. Mm -hmm. Double smoke. You couldn't see squat, you know. I, I thought I'd see them starting the, you know, the bridge and the things moving in it. All under smoke. Everything was smoke. And uh, so I, I didn't get to see it a hell of a lot, you know. But I, I kept watching, you know, and sometimes the wind would change a little bit and it would blow a little bit so you'd get a little bit of an opening, you know, you'd see what's going on. And uh, they were making, they put the approaches in and they had got the LCMs launched and uh, the guys had got across. Uh, and what they did with those scows that was off that uh, heavy ponton bridge uh, uh, equipment, they had outboard motors on them. And they had what they call chemical starters, so they all started at the same time. Nobody was pulling yeah. the dang thing because it wouldn't start. And uh, they were all, all gone, and they, 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 they made the crossing and everything. And uh, they had pushed far enough so that the 88s were not a problem, mm -hmm. uh, which they wouldn't do anything until they had that taken care of because I didn't want the bridge shelled with uh, 88s. Mm -hmm. And uh, pretty much there was no uh, air uh, 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 problem. Right. I don't know whether they had an airdrop or not because I, I, I didn't see it. And that would have been farther. Than yeah, there were paratroopers who landed on the other side in part. But it was a big, big campaign. It was oh yeah, a whole bunch of places they attacked. It was the second largest amphibious mm -hmm. uh, uh, action of the war in Europe. I mm -hmm. mean, it was next to Normandy, or uh, Normandy, yeah. and uh, so, so I didn't get to see a hell of a lot. But when daylight came, I uh, it was all smoke, and. Uh, I, I just hung around, you know, and there would be times when the smoke, the wind would blow the smoke away a little bit, you could see a little bit, but it was just pretty much all the smoke. And uh, so I didn't see much, but uh, as soon as they got the bridge across, and of course they had these LCMs that were uh, supplying the ammunition and the food and everything that and they had enough of them to keep supply. And they would bring back the wounded and whatever, you know. And they could, they could take a jeep over and a small, small truck. But they were all loaded with mostly ammunition mm -hmm. and uh, stuff. But uh, <clears throat> when we, uh, I, I just uh, just waited, and uh, they got the bridge in, and and then. Uh, I, I got could see, and the, the officers would want to go in, in, in and and uh, we uh, the first two divisions that went across on the bridge was the 95th and the 30th. Mm -hmm. The 30th was I think the ones that went across in the scows, and they also crossed on the Treadway Bridge that we this outfit our, our outfit built, and then the 95th went across. Well, this guy I met at the Tanglewood, he was in the 95th, mm -hmm. and uh, he was he, he keeps telling me, we crossed on your bridge, yeah. and I said, I didn't build that damn bridge. I said, I was in the outfit, but I, said, but I just drove the, the brass around, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he keeps talking about it, but if you, if, well, you've never been across them. A treadway bridge is, uh, you know what they are. Hmm? But can you describe it for the audience here? Hmm? Can you describe it? Well, uh, they have these rubber rafts, and uh, it's all built on these rubber rafts. And they have what they call a Brockway bridge truck. It's a redwood truck. It's built just for, for this purpose. It has two arms on it, and it has two treads on it. And the treads are about 10 feet long and about 4 feet wide, heavy, real heavy. And uh, what they do is they, they put one of these inflated rubber rafts uh, anchored into the river and uh, then they back the bridge truck onto the uh, uh, approach to that uh, raft 
and then the arms come down, and it has to be that they sit down at the same time. Mm -hmm. If one sits down before the other, it'll flip. So these arms come down, and at the same time, these heavy treads sit on that that, that uh, rubber raft, and, and then uh, the next truck will back up onto the, to that uh, raft, and then they, they set them down on the next one. But it's a matter of inflating, and the anchoring is the biggest mm -hmm. biggest headache and the biggest problem. The current in the Rhine River is very, very substantial, and you, you end up, you think the bridge is going to be straight like this or like this, you know. <laughs> it, particularly you get out in where the current is, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, anchoring it so that, you know, the damn thing don't get away. And then they had heavy pins like, about as wrong as a big as your wrist, uh, that pinned them together. And, and then the, these uh, bridge trucks would keep backing up onto the bridge. And as they put the new uh, raft down in and it was anchored properly, then they'd set another set of treads on that one and they'd pin it together. And that's a treadway bridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it took a lot of, uh, more than one treadway bridge company to put, put that bridge across the Rhine River, mm -hmm. I'll tell you that. Uh, so so uh, that's the way they, they do it. And about three days later, the, the first ones went over with these, these two divisions. Mm -hmm. And then we followed up about on the third day, then we went across. But, but while I was screwing around and just waiting, on me, uh, this this uh, major he was a he was another one that I had. He was a shoe uh, salesman. He was a major. Uh, his name was Roland, uh, and I was driving him at the time. And we were standing on one of these jetties that went on into the Rhine River, and we were watching the activity of the. LCMs and, and what was going on across the bridge and everything. You could see it all from on this little jetty. Well, while we was on this jetty, we look up and on the front porch of a house that was up on along the, the bank of the Rhine River, up, 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 up a ways, and it was probably about here to that, uh, that birdhouse out there, uh, up, and who was there but Eisenhower, Churchill and Montgomery, mm -hmm. and they were on the front porch of this this house, and they were talking. So we stood there and we was watching them, you know. Well, then all of a sudden, in comes one of these LCMs at the end of this jetty we were on, and they drop the doors and then they things down, and who comes down from up there? Churchill. And I didn't know this. I thought. He was going to go across the Rhine River, but it was a photo op, and he had all these guys behind him, you know, and everything, and, and, and they had these cameras and all this. He walks right by us. I could have reached out and touched him. He gets, he gets there, and we were this major, and I was the only two on that jetty, and he says, he looks at me, and he says, "Hey, Jim, or Yank? Hey, Yank? You call me a Yank?" <laughs> He had his gray admiral outfit on and a mm -hmm. black arona, and he goes down and they they get on that LCM at the end there, you know, and then they lift the doors up and everything. And there he is standing with these other guys at the end of it, looking over, you know, like as if he's going across the mm -hmm. Rhine River. And then they take his picture and all that kind of stuff. I begged this major to let me go down and get on that damn boat, uh, ship, you know, mm -hmm. and that LCM, you know. And I said, let's go, come on, let's go down there. <laughs> he wouldn't do it. And I thought about it, you know, but I thought, he, you know, he says no one, and I thought, he's just the kind of guy that would court march it for uh, any damn thing, you know, but he was a, mm -hmm. and uh, so we didn't get it. But I was in a barber shop one day after I got home, and he had all these old, uh, magazines and stuff like they had, you know. Well, he was telling me that, uh, what was it, you probably, well, you wouldn't know. They had, uh, it would be like Life Magazine, or it was the, the, the 
paper or the magazine that they got, like Life magazine or Look or whatever yeah. it was. And he was telling me, he says, that was on the front page of, uh, of one of those magazines. And I says, it was? He says, yeah, I he was on there. And I said, how long ago was it? He said, oh, you know, and he told me about it. And I said, well, Chris, I'll have to see if I can't find that. Uh, so I've been looking for it forever since, but I haven't been successful. But that was my experience with uh, uh, meeting Churchill. Right. <laughs> now, once the, you've built the bridge across the Rhine, and you go across the Rhine, now what do you do? We followed the uh, 95th uh, on up. They went on up to the Elbe River. Mm -hmm. And what the deal was, Patton and his, uh, when they uh, uh, captured that uh, railroad bridge that they didn't blow down right. and they got across, they got their treadway bridge across without any uh, uh, resistance mm -hmm. or any, uh, so they got across first, but uh, in between the two then, the, they had about 400,000 Germans right. that uh, was, was in this, they, they the were in this, pocket. they're yeah. in the pocket. Well. Uh, we was on. We was in support of this ninety uh, fifth division, mm -hmm. and and we were uh, going up to the Rhine River, or to the Ruhr, uh, Alb River, mm -hmm. and it was all in an industrial area, very very much uh, factories and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And what we would do is we would clean out these towns. Uh, in other words, what the deal was is uh, the towns would. They would throw a sheet out the window and hang it down in front of you know all of it like that you know. Well, then the other thing was is they had to turn in all their guns and they had to bring them to the burgomaster or the city hall or whatever it was. But there were always uh, some that they needed to clean out, and that was what we were doing. We was cleaning out these areas. Well, we was at one night that we was in this one town. And we were uh, cleaning out and out. I was going down the main drag, and, but some other uh, on the other side. And I was on one side of the street, and another guy. And one of the a German walked out out of one of the cellars, it, right in front of me, and he had his hands on the top of his head. You know, scared the hell out of me. You know, and uh, uh, I just waved my uh, car in. I'm like, I didn't know where to go. Mm -hmm. The MPs go that way. And he walked down the main in the middle of the street down down, and they gave me credit for capturing a there you <laughs> a go. German prisoner. <laughs> I, I I no more captured a German prisoner. He just he's a poor SOB, you know, that he wanted to stay alive too, you mm -hmm. know. And, and he probably was in the same boat as I was. He probably was a conscript, you know, that yeah. that Hitler got from maybe Romania or some place, you know, where they uh, he was no more German than I was, you know, but that was it. But that's what we did, and and we just followed the uh, on up, and then uh, the area where we were when the uh, war ended was uh, it was kind of a a rural area, but it wasn't a farming area. It was more of a, a lakes and woods and. Uh, mm -hmm and that kind of a area. And there was a few houses and it was more like maybe a resort area. Yeah. I don't think it was a black forest or anything, but there, there was a lot of woods. I shot a couple of deer there, I remember, uh, that we had for uh, for dinner. Uh, but uh, uh, we stayed in a, it was, I, I would say, comparable to a uh, uh, bed and breakfast or mm -hmm. something like what we have here. Like it's a big house, yeah. you know, that. That's where we we stayed while we was there, and uh, the war ended there. But we was in what they call the Jer the British sector, mm -hmm. and so we just sit there uh, uh, in this German or in this British sector until they relieved us. Well, uh, while we was there, uh, the uh, Catholic chaplain's driver and I did we got to leave. And they give us an option of either going, they'd fly us to England 
or we, we could go to the uh, to, to French Riviera, mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. and we didn't have no money, and England's expensive. And we had some cigarettes and some soap, and we had some uh, some good stuff. Mm -hmm. So we chose Nice, and we they took us to a train, and we we ended up down in Nice. We stayed in the Nogresco Hotel, the best one in, in Nice, and uh, uh, we had all this barracks bag full of, of loot, you know, our mm -hmm. stuff. We we always kept the chant candy bars that were in the, the chocolate ones, mm -hmm. that were in the K rations, in the cigarettes, you know, there was three or four cigarettes in a little package. Mm -hmm. We had we kept all that stuff. And then we always got a ration or sort of bottle mm -hmm. of cigarettes and I didn't smoke and he didn't smoke. So we was pretty well healed as far mm -hmm. as had stuff to uh, deal with. Well, when we got there, uh, we wouldn't want to go around with that barracks bag full of that stuff. So we uh, we ended up in a jewelry store and we made a deal and he, he bought all of this stuff. The only thing he wouldn't buy was a uh, life boy soap. <laughs> Couldn't give life boy soap away. They didn't like life boy soap. But uh, we gave it away. You know, you know, we got rid of it. But we had all kinds of money. We had French francs. We were just, and then we always kept a few cigarettes. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we always had one in our shirt pocket here, open. And then we always had a few in reserve. You know, that, that was back in the room. But that was our thing to really uh, be nice, you know, the, instead of tipping the waiter at the, at the Negresco, mm -hmm. you gave him a few cigarettes, you know, and the maid in the, uh, made up your bed and everything, mm -hmm. you give her a few cigarettes, and that was great, you know, only Christ, that was, that was better than giving them money, and then if somebody's nice to you, you know, you give them a couple of cigarettes, or the girls, you give them a candy bar, you know, mm -hmm. And there was just some little ones that came out of K-Rash. But we kept, the, we kept the candy, of course. But we had a good time. And uh, uh, we had to spend uh, this, all this money we had, you know. And uh, you, ever, you ever been to the uh, Mediterranean? I've been to that area, yeah. Have you? Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, in front of the Nice, it was right on the, right on the Mediterranean. It's not like sand like Lake Michigan. It's stones. Mm -hmm. And it's round stones so that they're not sharp or anything. Mm -hmm. So you can lay in the stones. It ain't too bad. But the beaches were helpless. The little kids up to maybe five, six, seven years old, they, they, they were nude. They mm -hmm. didn't have no clothes and they would go and swim. In. And, and the ladies laid around they were topless, and they went swim, swim, you know, paraded around mm -hmm. stupid. But we didn't have no swimming suit or anything, you know. So we went in in our shorts, just our, our, our underwear shorts. Mm -hmm. When we come out of the water, you know, it's all plastered <laughs> against you, you know. But they don't care, you know. So, and we'd lay in the stones and sun, you know, and everything, and it was it was nice. And uh, uh, one thing that that, that we we uh, happened that uh, we was trying to spend some of our money, so we went into a a ladies' store, and this fellow I was with, his name was uh, Bob uh, DeKalb, and he was the uh, altar boy and the driver for the chaplain, Catholic chaplain. His he had a girlfriend. Her name was Dusty, and he ended up marrying her, and my girlfriend. His name was Doris, and I ended up marrying her. <laughs> well, we went into this lady's store, and uh, we was looking for something to, to send home. And they told us, all you got to do is pick it out. We'll see that it gets home, and we'll make out the packaging and everything. You know, we didn't. We was a little worried about that. They said, Oh yeah, we will. We'll do it. Don't worry. But we got in there, and they started showing us. Uh, different things, and they would model it, you know, mm -hmm. they had models. We got down to negligees, <laughs> <laughs> and we thought, we got to do something here. <laughs> so we both bought a negligee. I bought my wife a negligee. I, it's still up in the attic someplace. 
Um, and uh, they sent it home, and, and my wife got it, and it, I, I, she, she got it, and uh, I don't think she ever wore it much, but <laughs> it's still, I think it's up in the loft of the garage. But anyway, uh, that was one of the things we did, but one of the other things which was nice was we met this nice lady, she was beautiful, young gal, her name was Dita Stara. I can remember the mm -hmm. beautiful women, you know. Well, anyway, she was pushing her bike along and she had two long loaves of French bread uh, tied on the back on mm -hmm. the rack. And, and we got talking to her. She, she was walking along and, and, and she was uh, able to talk some English, you know, and uh, we got talking and we, so we walked along, you know, and uh, she finally said, well, uh, come to my villa. And she lived mm -hmm. right along on the Mediterranean. Well, she invited us to her villa. And uh, I guess it was supper, I guess, or something. And so uh, that was that night we, we were going to go to her, her home. And she was, uh, her mother must have been either French and her father was Moroccan, mm -hmm. or vice versa, but she was that in between, you know, mm -hmm. and, and beautiful. I got a picture of her, but I, I can't get up in the loft to get it. Well, anyway, her name was Dita Stara. And uh, so we, uh, at, when we went to, to, to visit there, and have, she said to have supper, we thought we'd want to bring some champagne. So we bought this champagne from this guy, it, it was supposed to have been the, the best you could buy, you know. We got there, when we opened it up, she started laughing and laughing and laughing, you know. And we couldn't figure out what the hell is she laughing about, you know. Well, the guy had given us a screw on, and, and it was apple juice. Oh. And, and, but, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know no better, and it was apple juice. But that's what I remember about that. But that's what we did, and then we was up in that British sector for quite a while until the British relieved us. And so we did a little looting and a little this and that, you know. And I, uh, I got a nice Hano Mag four-cylinder convertible sedan mm -hmm. that I. I liberated. Okay. Uh, it, it was in this driveway or in this garage, uh, and next to this house, and they had built a bomb shelter in the driveway, right in front of the garage. This mm -hmm. this bomb shelter is all cement and the concrete and everything. You know, that's why it was still in the garage because nobody could get it out of there. So we get some of the demolition boys that had the, the TNT and we powdered that thing up and you know, we blew it to hell, that bomb shelter. And then we pushed the, the stuff aside and dragged the hammer bag out of there. All it needed was some good GI gas and mm -hmm. we were in business. So we rode around in a convertible hammer bag. I give it to a British guy when I when we had to get I get to move out of there. Now, did you move then to a different sector? We moved from uh, there to back to La Havre. Okay. And that's where they said well, that's where our outfit was broke up. Okay. This you, you know about this, don't you? Where you had to have the points to, right. to get out. Well, this is where they they did the um, evaluating. Mm -hmm. If you was thirty two. He was, he was out. I mean, that was an action. And I don't know what all the criteria was, but if you was married and you had children back home, you you mm -hmm. made it. But it was the young guys that, that, that really got it. And I was young, so I didn't have many points. And, and you had to be, to get points, you had to be in the uh, combat zone. Mm -hmm. not, not in England, you know, but yeah. you had to be in Germany and all that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have very many points. So the outfit was broke up. But we spent quite a bit of time during that time that it was being broke up and they was doing the evaluating and everything. And in order to kill time, uh, I, uh, they had equipment. I drove a gravel truck. 
it was a six by six, only instead of having a cargo body, it had a dump body on it. And I, I, I like doing that, and uh, they was uh, repairing the roads and trying to rebuild, you know, f for the people to get things uh, a little bit back to normal. And the people were trying to mm -hmm. uh, rebuild, and they were knocking the mortar off of the bricks and stuff, and they're piking them up in front mm -hmm. of the uh, lot so they could rebuild. And so I drove that gravel truck mostly while I was in La Havre waiting mm -hmm. for an evaluation and what they were going to do with me. Well, when they decided, they shipped a whole bunch of us to uh, uh, Epernay. That was back in France, in northern mm -hmm. France. And we went in a tent city, it was a tent camp. And we uh, was housed in those tents. We ate uh, field rations and in, in, in out of our mess kits mm -hmm. and stuff. We ate on the ground or wherever we could find a place to sit or anything. So it was pretty Spartan deal, but it, you know, yeah, we what, didn't do nothing. Yeah, what time of year was it then? Was it getting late in the year? Uh, no, let's see, that would have been... No, it was pretty good weather. It was decent weather, okay. as I recall. Yeah, because, yeah, we, 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 we played baseball and mm -hmm. we, you know... Uh, well, the fall can be mild in France if you get the right year. Yeah, well, it was outside of this town of Epernay. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one day, well, I, I was there, you know, well, a guy rolls up in a Jeep and he hollers out he, my name and he says, I'm looking for, for, for me, you know. And I said, who the hell is this guy? What does he want? And, and he says, uh, get your gear and come with me. So I picked up my gear and got in the Jeep with him, you know, and I says, where are we going? He says, well, we ain't very far. He says, uh, you'll be there in a, little, in a minute. So we went through Epernay and then out in the country. And we went through this little town and it maybe it was maybe five, six kilometers outside of Epernay. We come to this great big chateau out in the, in the, in a field in the country. Mm -hmm. Big white deal, all these round steps out in front of it, you know, going up to the, to the deal. And there were some other outbuildings, you know. And then a beautiful place, you know. And then he wheels in there, you know, big long driveway going into it, you know. Holy Christ, what's going on? So we get there and he says, come on. And we climb all those stairs up to the, going into this chateau. And we go in there and there's this lady. Big, t she was a tall, slim lady, very attractive for her age. I was, but she was a looker during her time. Mm -hmm. But she was gray haired and I'd say she maybe was 60. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, she was in this kind of room and uh, we went in there, and uh, the guy says, uh, here's the guy, and, and she looks me over, she says, you smoke? I said, no. You drink? No. Uh, you, you speak French? And I says, "Em te peu. And, and, and she, she looked me over, you know, and she says, he'll do. And then she said, get a haircut. And I, and I thought, where the hell am I going to get a haircut? But then she says, take care of him and show him where he's going to bunk down and then what, what is the deal, you know. So the guy takes me and I said, what the hell's going on? He says, you're going to be the colonel's driver, new driver. And I said, yeah, I am? He said, yeah. He says, come on, I'll show you what, what you're going to be driving. So we go down to where the horses, this is a horse barn and place, you know. But they had the cars and everything. This was a, uh, a LaSalle. It had... Uh, stars on it and all the old D and everything and no better. And he says, this is what you're going to be driving. And then he showed me around a little bit. But everything was run by POWs. Everything. Mm -hmm. uh, the household, the, everything. And the POWs did everything. And uh, he says, do you want anything? Just tell the POW. And, and showed me where I was going to bunk in the, in the chateau and everything. You know. He says, tomorrow morning you'll be at the bottom of those stairways at 8 o'clock. Okay, so I did during that during that, that thing up there at eight o'clock in the morning. I'm there. I'm at the bottom of the stair with the door open, you know. Uh, and pretty soon the colonel he comes walking down, you know. And oh, you know, I never met him. I didn't know who the hell he was or anything. You know, I snap my salute, you know. And, and he hops in the car and close the door, you know. And, and then he says, uh, "I'll tell you where where to go." 
and then he told me how to mm -hmm. where to go. And we went back to Epernay, and then then we went and went uh, south out of Epernay. We went to Reims. Mm -hmm. Well, his office was in the schoolhouse where the uh, surrender of the Germans was mm -hmm. in that, in that schoolhouse. That's where his office was. So we go there and are you interested in knowing what the schoolhouse looked like? Hmm? Well, the schoolhouse was a dirty brown or dirty um, uh, red mm -hmm. and but it's born, built just like everything is right on the edge of the street and the uh, administration part of it was all in the front uh, but it was built in a u-shape and then it had two wings on each side and it was two-story but all the stairways and everything was outside and and inside of the u was the playground for the kids but you had an air, outdoor outdoor store a stairway to go up to the second floor and an outside a porch railing deal that went around along to the different uh, rooms, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the way it was laid out. But this room that the armistice or the surrender was signed in was in this front part, and I just go walk by it maybe half a dozen times a day, you know. But all it was was a small room had a long uh, table in it with chairs in it. And they had a chain across the doors, so they didn't want you to walk in, going in there. And that's the only way it, it, it was. Well, uh, I, I was his driver, and I learned as I, we went along, you know. But he was kind of a he, he, he was from the old. He was an old from the old uh, before the war. You mm -hmm. know, he was old army. He right. was a, actually a cavalry guy. He was a cavalry guy. That's where his background was. Well, anyway, he was the chief honcho for that particular, they call it the Oz Section 6 of, of uh, uh, France that he, he was over. Mm -hmm. And this is where this chateau was. This is what this is where his house. This was mm -hmm. where he was housed. I mean, that was that. It was the only one that was there. He was no other officers or anything. He was his house, and so uh, the other officers were that worked in this uh, Reims uh, deal. Mm -hmm. they, they had a officers complex there in Reims. Well, sometimes, uh, in fact, every day uh, at, at lunchtime, well, I I would they they walked just across the street a little bit to the officer's mess and it was in a house. Mm -hmm. uh, china plates and white tablecloths and all that, you know, where the officers ate and everything. And, uh, and, but I would drive over there and it was in a courtyard kind of a place and it had a big stone or a brick wall around it with iron spikes on the top and all that and an iron gate and everything. But I had to eat in the kitchen. But I ate the same chow as an officer, but I had to eat in the kitchen. Well, that's that's the way it was. And uh, um, sometimes, well, he was he would stay overnight. He wouldn't go back to the. And then uh, I had to stay in Reims too. Well, then I slept in a room in the attic of this where the officers' mess was. But I ate in the kitchen there for my meals and stuff. I had two waitresses there. And they served uh, these uh, officers on china plates, white tablecloths, real real fancy, you know. And there must have been about, I'd say maybe four or five tables, you know, that the officers were at. And uh, when, I, when he stayed overnight, he stayed there at the officer's uh, billet wherever they was. I never saw where the hell it was even, but they walked to it. I never drove to it. And I would stay uh, and sleep, uh, had a place up in the attic. Uh, and uh, I got to know the waitresses uh, pretty well. In fact, uh, they liked to get out of there as quick as they could at night because, you know, it was a long day for them. 
they had to have breakfast, you know, mm -hmm. and they'd get their, you know, to have breakfast served and everything. And so I'd help them, you know. I mean, uh, they would set the table up for morning for breakfast, you know, and I'd go and put the plates or I'd pick mm -hmm. up the dirty dishes and stuff, and I'd help them. So I got to know them pretty well, and good. they were real nice to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't figure out which one I liked the most. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was the dark-haired one instead of the blonde. And so, uh, once in a while, I'd walk her home after work. But that was a problem. Uh, I'd come back and the gates locked and everything, you know, and, I, and I, I, then I'm out. But I figured out how to do it. I'd climb a tree and then I'd climb out on the limb and then I'd drop down on the inside uh, of the wall. <laughs> but that was it. And, so it was no problem, you know. Mm -hmm. That was, I guess, frosting on the cake, I guess, you know, that I, that, that I got to you know with these, these gals. Mm -hmm. And they were really nice, you know, and they taught me a lot of French, you know, I mean, and, and they, they wanted to know English, too. Mm -hmm. They were nice. And uh, I, I got to tell you, uh, the colonel loosened up as we got to know him, he'd ask me, you know, where were you mm. from, you know, you know. And he, he called me Ramsey. That, that he didn't care, know what my first name mm. was or he didn't care. Where are you from? And I, I told him, I said, Michigan. And uh, uh, we got to know, and he says, one day all went right out of the blue. He says, uh, uh, you ever ride a horse? You, you know anything about horse riding? I said, no. I said, my dad was a milkman. I said, he had horse routes and where they had horses uh, that pull the milk wagon. I said, once in a while, I said, my dad have to take the horse down to the sh blacksmith shop to get new shoes. And I said, it was quite a ways from the, the dairy barn where they mm -hmm. kept the horses down to where the blacksmith shop was downtown. And I said, my dad used to take and put the horse, uh, a line on the horse's halter uh, through the window of the car and he'd go slow along and the horse would walk alongside of the car. He said, then my dad would let me ride on the horse. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'd just sit up there and the horse would walk along with it. I said, that's my only experience in, in, in riding horse. I said, he was a milk horse. Mm -hmm. He says, would you like to learn? I said, oh yeah, that'd be nice. He says, and he used to ride uh, mm -hmm. once in a while. He had a horse, it was a, a gray one. And they had about six or eight real nice riding horses. I think they belonged to the Bicomas. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, he says, well, t tell them to saddle you up a horse too. So he goes up and he gets his riding boots on and his riding deal and all that, you know. And he comes down and, and there I am with his his gray horse, the Alp, the, the POWs holding for him, you know, and then one for me. So then he shows me how to get on and what to do and all that, you know, and they were, uh, they were English saddles. They weren't like what we have, mm -hmm. you know, with a horn on it, like the or Western. And so uh, I would, he'd go ahead, you know, and I'd be behind, you know, and I'd, I'd stay with him, you know, and we adjusted the stirrups to my liking, you know, and everything, and I did all right, but you know, then we go across the countryside, you know, and everything, and uh, it was it was nice. But he loosened up, you know, some, you know, but not too much. All but right. I got to tell you, now we got to pause right here because this tape. You you finished off hour number two here, so oh. I got to. Okay, so we've gotten in your story to the point where you've got the uh, assignment now where you're working for this colonel and he's taking you out, you learn to ride horses and so forth, uh, and then off camera you mentioned that uh, the, the, the secretary, who was the woman who had greeted you when you first got there, oh, uh, that, that she liked you too. We got to be real good. Uh, are, are we on tape yes, now? Yes, we are. Well, Odette uh, kind of took me under her, her wing, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was very good counsel for me. And you know what she liked about me? Whenever I talked to her, I tried to talk to her in French. Mm -hmm. It was always in French. And then she would correct me, mm -hmm. and she would get a lot of laughs mm -hmm. out of my cobbled up what I was trying to say. But I always spoke to her in French. Mm -hmm. She liked that. And she, she 
told me, you know, that we got to have a class. We're going to have class, and I'll, I'll, we'll have classes, and I'll really teach you really mm -hmm. French, you know, because my French was not, you know, it was enough I could get by, you know, but that was it. But she was a nice lady, uh, and uh, she gave me a lot of good counsel, you know, particularly with a colonel, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Don't do this, don't do that, do this, you know. And so I was, I was very thankful for that. But the, the colonel also uh, was, when he watched his, uh, his uh, health and his condition, he, he'd have me sometimes take him out in the boonies, way out on some country road, and dump him off three, four mm -hmm. miles from the uh, chateau and dump him off. And I'd, I'd just leave him and go back and he'd have to walk back. And he did that once in a while, but in other times he, he would, the horses, he, mm -hmm. he liked to ride the horses. Of course, he was a cavalry guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that was nice that, you know, he let me uh, go with him a couple of times. But I, I, it was nice. Okay. About how long did you have that job? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, we were supposed to go to Patton's, Patton's funeral the day that I got my orders okay. to come home. So that's like December. That was a big, that was a yeah. big deal. Yeah. Well, let me go back a little bit. Um, uh, we got to know uh, one better as we moved along, and he, he loosened up. and uh, But he was very much uh, salute. Mm -hmm. Uh, military courtesy, you, you didn't get out of line, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He was a peon, he was a buck private, I'm the boss, I'm the colonel. So I mean it was that, that way, and that was okay. But uh, I'll have to tell you, uh, one day um, Odette told me, he says, uh, you're going to Switzerland. And I says, I am. She says, the colonel's got, got leaving, he, he's going to switch, he wants you to go to, we're going to go to switch, you're going to go to Switzerland. And I says, I am? She says, yeah. She says, but uh, you can only uh, cash in 250 American into Swiss dollars. He said, you're going to have to pay your own way as far as the hotel and your food, whatever they else. And I said, I ain't got no money. Uh, and she says, we'll take care of that. Mm -hmm. So they she took care of that and everything, you know. And so when the colonel said we're going to Switzerland, I'm on, on leave. We went to Switzerland, and Christ, they trot me they said, like as if I was a general or something. You know, I had that American uniform on. They didn't know I was a. But we stayed in the same hotel, but of course not. not and he was in maybe mm -hmm. some big place, but I was in the same hotel. Mm -hmm. We didn't eat together or anything, but sometimes we did. And I went my way, and he went his way, you know, and I had my 250 buns, and you only had 250 uh, mm -hmm. American Swiss. So he was real, it reined in too, you know, he couldn't go too hard wide. You know? mm -hmm. Well, we got in the CERN, and uh, I thought, well, I'm going to go down to one of these casinos, and I'm going to work my 250 uh, Swiss into some mm -hmm. real spending money. That was a big mistake. <laughs> that was a big mistake. But I did get to do a little, and Adette told me, you know, she said, uh, I said, I want to buy my dad a nice gift, and my sister, I said, and, and she told me, I said, I want to buy my dad a nice watch, and she told me what to buy. She mm -hmm. said, buy a Longine or a mm -hmm. Rolex or a Omega, and she gave me good mm -hmm. advice, you know, what to do and everything, and, and she, she really counseled me on, 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 on what to do. And I never questioned where the money came from or anything, but they gave me the Swiss francs. So I was on the same level with the colonel as far as money was concerned. But when we got there, we went to, uh, I think it was a CERN first, and then we went to Zurich, and, and uh, then we went to, in the little villages and the Alps and all that kind of stuff. Well, we did really saw Switzerland. And when we got in these little villages and stuff off the beaten path and thing. It would be lunchtime or something, you know, and, and then we would eat together. We'd go into these little, I don't know what you call them. Inns or whatever, yeah. Little inns or whatever, you know, and 
we'd have some dark bread and Swiss cheese and, and a glass of wine, you know, and stuff, and we'd sit together and everything, you know. And here, here I was. I didn't have nothing on my sleeves or anything. I was just a buck driver, mm -hmm. and uh, it was pretty nice. But they treated me just royally. You know what I mean? I was treated uh, really royally, and. Uh, it was really nice, and we saw we went to Zurich and everything. We we saw Switzerland, yeah. And uh, there weren't very many guys that was a, a GI that got to Switzerland. Yeah, that's that's not too common. It's not during the war. After the war, it was a little easier, but still not not usually where you went. Yeah. Well, it was after the war. yeah. Yeah. It was after but the even war. then, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, now, that was my experience with going to uh, uh, to uh, Switzerland. Well. Uh, I uh, uh, tried to be a good good driver, and I, I minded my own business. He had a, a kind of a, a shine on the Viscountess that owned the, the villa where, where we were staying. Mm -hmm. In other words, when the military took out yeah. over it, she got ousted, and she lived quite close in one of the houses that were used by her help mm -hmm. that her maid and yeah. gardener and all that kind of but that's she housed all of them and everything but she took over one of those houses and it was a little ways from the, uh, the uh, chateau and he used to like to sit, go to see her all the time and some evenings he'd, he'd say uh, 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 seven o'clock I want you to we're going to go you know and it, usually it was over to the Viscounts mm -hmm. and then he'd say uh, pick me up at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, or whatever it is. I always made it a point that if he said 10 o'clock, I got there at 9.30. If he said 11 o'clock, I got there at 10.30. I mean, I always was waiting there with the door open when he came out of that, that house where he was with the bike uh, I, I, I realized that, you know, this, this is where I belong. I, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't screw up. But, and I used to take the car and I'd drive into Epernay and I had a girlfriend in Epperton, eh? Uh, what was her name? I can't remember, <laughs> but I can remember her baby's name. She had a little baby. And she was about four or five years, she about maybe five years older than I was. But she was a nice lady. And uh, she'd invite me to her home, you know, and all that. But I never let her ride in the car. She always wanted to ride in the car, but I never would allow that. No, no. That was it. I realized that, you know, this is not, that's not right. Mm -hmm. And so I never allowed her to ride in the car. But uh, she had this little, little baby. He was in a high chair, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, his name was Christian. And <laughs> once in a while, I always brought him something, you know. I mean, it would be uh, uh, whatever I could scrounge up out of the kitchen, you know, mm -hmm. K ration, whatever it was. But I always brought him things. And the old man, I always brought him cigarettes. And. Uh, uh, stuff and uh, so they were very good to me and uh, uh, what really struck me the first time I, I, I had dinner there was the little baby was in a high chair you know and he had one of the, he wasn't on a bottle but he had one of them cups mm -hmm. tin cups you know instead of milk you know it was wine <laughs> wine and water wine and water yeah. and I thought holy Christ and the baby's drinking wine and water and it ain't even out of diapers yet you know, but that's the way they that's do it. The culture, yeah. yeah. And but that, that was it. Nice. And uh, but he spent a lot of time with. He, he liked to go over to the Viscounts, and some days that they'd go in the afternoon. He liked to play tennis, and they had a tennis court. And it, I'd take him to the tennis court, and, and uh, um, the Viscounts, and they'd hit the ball over the fence, and then I'd go chase the balls <laughs> and throw them back, and you know, and all that, you know, but. Uh, I was a stooge, you know, and, but I was a good stooge. I knew my place, and uh, I got to tell you this. One day it was in the after it was in the afternoon. Uh, he says that we're going to go pick up the viscountess, and they were going to go someplace. So we went and picked up the viscountess, and they, she said, "Well, go into Epernay." Well, what they did, what she did was, she took us to her champagne factory. 
she owned the champagne factory in Epernay. Mm -hmm. It was called the Piper Heitzig. Okay, that's a, that's a big company, yeah. You, you know she yep. Piper Heitzig? Yeah. Yep. Oh. Well, she owned it. We went there, you know, and I get out and open the door for me and everything, you know, like that. And they get out, you know, and she says, come along, come along and to me, you know, like that. And I looked, you know, I looked at the colonel, and he gave me a dirty look, you know, and she says, come along, come along. And I, I, I slammed the car door, and I, I went and joined him. He didn't like it, but I was there. She, she was the one that was calling the shots. Mm -hmm. Gives a complete tour from the start of how champagne is made with the squeeze of grapes, the grapes and all that thing. We got down in the archives, you know, where the tunnels were and all it is and everything else. Very interesting, very interesting. We got down in these long tunnels where they had, and on each darkest pitch, darker, you just you couldn't see the hand in front of you. On each side is is these racks, and they have these bottles of champagne on a forty-five in these racks, mm -hmm. and they have these what they call uh, uh, shakers, and all the guy does is he goes shakes mm -hmm. these bottles, uh, all and, and goes along. Well, when we were down in these uh, long tunnels, I call them, uh, you could see the light of the shaker. What they had was a couple of bare wires up in the top of the uh, cavern, and uh, they had a long wooden pole that came down, and on top of it, it had a light. And as you slid that pole along on that bare wire, the light lit up. Mm -hmm. And so while we was down there, we had one of those, and we'd slide it along, and and uh, we'd, we'd see uh, the, the shaker was so far away, but she just described, you know, what, what they were doing and shaking. And seven years, seven years of that you know, big wine there. Well, we got the complete tour, and we went back to where they was showed where they bottled it, mm -hmm. that final thing, and where it was ready to be uh, uh, sent to market. You know what she does? She gives the colonel a magnum. Mm -hmm. You know what a magnum is? It's a very large bottle. Then she gives me a magnum. <laughs> and the colonel, he only crazy about fell through the floor, you know. I took it. Mm -hmm. and, and man, I cradled that like a, it was a little baby, you know. And I didn't want to drop that sucker, you know. And, and uh, uh, I. Thanked her profusely, you know, and all the crap. Bonjour, bonjour, merci beaucoup, bonjour, beaucoup, bonjour, merci. Oh, you know, it's crazy. Uh, she, she really knew that I appreciated it, you know. Well, as soon as we got back uh, to the uh, chateau where and I, I was able to get down to the barn, and I got one of the uh, PWs to build me a wooden box. Mm -hmm. And we we packed a wooden box with hay mm -hmm. and the, and the magnum in this wooden box, all packed in hay, and put a label on it and shipped it home. And it it was it it ended up with my wife. Mm -hmm. it, it was she was my girlfriend at the mm -hmm. time, and I didn't know it, but she didn't open it up until I came home, and then they popped the cork when I when I got home. <laughs> but a magnum, yeah, huh? That's, that's pretty good. That that's pretty good, ain't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, it all ended when uh, uh, every day uh, they got a messenger. It came from Reims on a motorcycle. And I have to tell you this. Uh, one day he was there. Uh, he comes on this. It was a Harley 45 military bike that he brought messages from uh, Reims. So I got to talking to him, and I says, "Let me try riding that. Let me see that. Let me show me that." And, and he gave me enough instruction, you know, so I, I took it out in the field and I rode it around the pasture and around, you know, and I was riding around like that. And I thought I was doing pretty good, you know, so I took it out on the road and uh, I was doing pretty good, and I'm going down the road, you know, and, but all of a sudden I was going through this village you know, between Epernay and where we were, and somebody backed out on some side street in front of me and I put on the brakes and I went right over the can bars. And I, it, there's a cavil, or cobblestone streets in our rooms. Mm -hmm. I was skinned up pretty good, but 
uh, that was my end of my motorcycle. But it, the car, the bike was all right. It didn't get banged up. But uh, that was my end of my motorcycle. Yep. So I never rode a motorcycle. Yeah, but that was it. But, but did that guy bring in the news on who was going home or that kind of thing? That was what I, that was, yeah. Well, it was the day before, it was the next day we were supposed to go to Patton's funeral. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I knew that. And the guy comes from Reams with the messages and stuff. And Audette calls me and she says, uh, we got orders here that, and she told me about what the orders were, you know, that I would had orders to go home. Mm -hmm. And, and she, she says, uh, you're not going to go home, are you? And I said, I sure as hell am. I said, uh, why wouldn't I? She says, why would you want to go? You got it nice here. And I, mm -hmm. I said, I, said <laughs> I only want to be in the Army as long as I have to be. I said, I'm a draftee. I'm not no volunteer. And she tried to, they tried to convince me. And then the colonel tried. Mm -hmm. He actually in person. He told me, he says, oh, I'll, drop, I'll have you flown home. He said, you go to a cigarette camp. He said, you'll be there for two months trying to, you know, for to get a boat. Mm -hmm. And I knew that. And I, I, I was weighing all this, you know, and he was telling me, you know, that uh, he would do this for me, you know, and all this and all that. And I was weighing all that, you know, and I, I was thinking about it. And I only had just so much time to, I had to say, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going home. And so I made the decision that I'm going home. Uh, whether it was wrong or right, I, to this day, I, I figure, it was a draw, okay. uh, because what it was back home, what I thought it was going to be, was not. You know what I mean? I thought it was going to be like it was when I left. It sure as hell wasn't. Before we get there and take you back home, I have a couple other questions. One of them is, you mentioned when you were talking about the, the colonel of the, the 1153rd and so forth, and yeah. you said that you eventually got back at him. Oh, yes. That's when we were up in Germany. We had a non-fraternization. Uh, you couldn't talk to the... If you had to, because you wanted to ask directions or something, but you couldn't uh, uh, fraternize. You couldn't, you couldn't uh, go and visit them at their house mm -hmm. and uh, whatever, you know. Non-fraternization meant you didn't associate. You, you just... They were off limits. Mm -hmm. Well, when we was up in Germany waiting for the British uh, to relieve us, we didn't have no association with the, the uh, officers. They was off by themselves. We was in another area. We never seen them. Uh, our direction was all non-coms. They, they never even bothered because uh, they, uh, they were, uh, there no reason why they had to throw their weight around. Mm -hmm. Well, one day, uh, uh, this uh, one of these captains, and I forget what his name was, I think it was Hernandez, mm -hmm. uh, said, uh, we got to go to, uh, it was uh, 16th Corps headquarters. And I, I, okay, so we drove to 16th Corps headquarters. The colonel that was in charge of, of our outfit and everything had been court-martialed. And he was under house arrest uh, in this town in where the 16th Corps mm -hmm. was. We were going there to bring him some cigarettes <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and a couple of magazines or something, whatever we had, you know. So. I didn't know this, but we go there, you know, and there's this colonel under house arrest, and he was in this house, and he was up um, maybe on a second floor or something. And so our only contact with him was he with the window open, and we talked to him uh, through, uh, through the window. Well, here I was down there throwing cigarettes up to him, and he was under house arrest. And I was the SOB down there that he, mm -hmm. uh, that he knew, uh, I thought, 
the Lord sure works in weird places, we, a crazy way, doesn't he? What was he court-martialed for? Fraternization. He was shacked up with some woman oh. in, in, in Germany there. Uh -huh. We had a, a S3, his name was, uh, what was his name? He was the S3, he was a major. What was his name? I can't remember. Well, anyway, him and the colonel didn't get along again, mm -hmm. and this uh, major, uh, what was his name? Well, anyway, he thought that he deserved a promotion to lieutenant and whatever, mm -hmm. but the colonel, no, no, he, he didn't like him, but they didn't mm -hmm. get along well. So this uh, major that was the S3 in the headquarters squealed on him, mm -hmm. and that was what it, what it was. And everybody thought that's so be for squealing on them, you know. But I don't know. Yeah. I guess maybe you that's you didn't mind, huh? You didn't mind. <laughs> Irony of it, huh? No. Huh? I couldn't believe it. You know, here I am throwing cigarettes up to him, you know. And he knew who I was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On a different note, can you tell me what happened to Captain Spaulding? Pardon? Can you tell me what happened to your captain? Because he didn't oh, come home. Oh well. Uh, all of a sudden, one day he never showed up. You know, he, they they transferred him out. Okay. Well, he never should have been um, in it anyway because mm -hmm. he just was not. He was not. You know, he was not capable or, of of the position that he was in, a captain or anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he was there because he was a big shot. Yeah. In, in civilian life, you know, and he was a big uh, contractor that. Uh, supposed to be, you know, uh, know his business and mm -hmm. uh, the contract construction business, and mm -hmm. uh, which would be in the construction business right. of the army. But one day he didn't show up. I tried to find out what happened to him, you know. And I cost. I'd ask all around everybody, like, no, you know, what mm -hmm. happened? Where were you? The best information that I got was that he was shipped to Antwerp, mm -hmm. and that uh, he was a drinker. And he got drunk one night, and he fell into the fireplace. Oh, that was what I—that's what I was told. I, I never revealed that to anybody, but that's what I was told. So that—that's all I can tell you. Okay. And then, did you have another story about uh, Captain Hernandez? Oh yeah. He would get you in a scrape, just too sweet. In other words, when you was out with him. He was a gun collector. Mm -hmm. You know, I told you about these towns where we would go yeah. in, you know, and they had to turn in all their weapons mm -hmm. into the burgomaster. Then. We'd go into a town, and he was interested in, he, where's the burgomaster? He'd get in that room where all the guns were turned in, and the, the Germans, there, you know. I'd be there with my arms out like this, and I'd walk out of there with, like as if I had a whole load of firewood, you know. Rifles, everything you know, you could think of, you know. Well, once in a while, I'd pick up one myself, you know, mm -hmm. something that interests me. But he'd, he'd have the whole back end of the uh, command car full of these guns. Well, then his problem was that he had to get them shipped home. Yeah. Well, certain of them would go on regular a 75 uh, caliber or a, uh, a shell case. But some of them were too long. They needed a 90 millimeter mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, or shell case. Mm -hmm. So then we had to find an outfit that had patent tanks that had 90 millimeter guns. And uh, then he would, when what's what we'd find, he'd go all over looking for uh, find one, you know, and he'd look up all the information he could get to find out where there was an outfit, a tank outfit that had 90 millimeter or a patent tanks. And when, when he'd find one, he didn't give a damn whether they, uh, he'd pile into one of them tanks and He'd get up in there and he'd pitch out the tubes out of there and I'd pick them up and put them in the damn command car, you know. And then the tank's got a whole bunch of exposed shells in the damn thing, you know. But he didn't give a damn. Mm -hmm. But I'll have to tell you how he went around. Uh, he had a paratrooper's wire stock uh, uh, carbine, just mm -hmm. like what I have, only had a wire stock. And it had a sling there over like this mm -hmm. and it, he carried it on his back. Then he was from um, he was from uh, New Mexico. You, you know how in the movies they had these uh, these cowboys that had these low slung, mm -hmm. quick 
draw things, you know, yeah. with a leather thing around him with all the bullets in it, you know, and everything like that. That's what he wore. <laughs> Strapped to his leg, like and he had a P38 in that in that switch draw holster. Mm -hmm. That's how he went around. That, that was the way he he he, he went. That was uh, was it. I always would catch him, you know. What the hell are you going around with that thing for? You're going to find some German standing in the middle of the street, going to have a gunfight with you. <laughs> <laughs> He'd say, when I fall out of that Jeep, I want to come up with something smoking. <laughs> that was his comment. But he'd get anywhere near the front. He wanted to go. You know, he, I said, no, nah, I'll stay here. You go ahead. And, and sometimes he would. You know, when we were on the Royal River, uh, he'd go there all the time, you know, and that's, you know, that's where the action was. I was a little rocked, and I, I would, you know, I, I didn't, I'd tag along, but I, I wasn't out in front. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he was always looking for trouble. And he was that kind of guy, you know. But, but he was, he was able to handle it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there was any guy that you, you got in a scrape with, and you really need somebody, you know, that knew him, he was the guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was none of the other one in the whole outfit other than him that I would have. Uh, wanted to take orders from. Mm -hmm. They all were, most of them were shoe salesmen. Right. Okay. So now, to go back to the main line of your story, so you finally, so rather than going to Patton's funeral or staying on, you ship home. So how long did you spend in a cigarette camp? I, I was shipped to Chesterfield. Okay. That's the cigarette camp that I was in. And I was there quite a while. Uh, but uh, the thing I can remember, and it it was uh, not too bad. You know, we, we didn't do nothing. I mean, mm -hmm. we just waited for the boat. But because I was a driver, uh, and they did have some equipment around there that mm -hmm. if you wanted to uh, do some work, you know, and I, mm -hmm. I was one that didn't want to lay around. I, I would I would do whatever was doable. Mm -hmm. Well. Uh, they knew I was a driver, and so one day they they said uh, we're going to give uh, a bunch of them a uh, weekend pass to Paris. Well, to Paris is quite a ways, mm -hmm. and they doesn't mean as the driver. Well, when you drive, you're the boss. You could guy have all bars to your wrist, and it wouldn't make no difference. You you was the one that run the show. And, and so I had about probably 20 guys get in a six by six, and I was a driver, and we drove to Paris. And of course, the big shot, you know, they want to drive right in the front. Mm -hmm. My friend, whoever, I forget who it was, but I had a friend, he drives, he rides in the front, and they, they, they get in the back. And so I was, I was the one that called the shots. Mm -hmm. So we we drive to and it's quite a ways, you know. And it's six by six, you know. You're if you get her up to fifty, you're doing pretty good, you know. And we got to Paris, and they have uh, uh, places where you military park, and they were mm -hmm. under guard and everything, you know. But there would be outfits from all over, you know. That they're, they're, you could see their uh, uh, outfit on their bumper of their uh, of their. Uh, a, a truck, truck yeah. whatever it was, and so we spent the weekend in, in Paris, and of course they they had places in Paris where military could get their could eat, mm -hmm. but no place to sleep. You had to buy your, your own place. So we didn't have no money, so we just bummed and crawled all night, you know, and. Uh, we, we saw Paris real well, you know. I had a friend and I, and we went our way and everything, and some of them just got drunk, and some mm -hmm. guys, whatever, you know, what are they going to do? And I went to the Louvre and mm -hmm. all of the things, you know, and the Seine River and all over. And one thing I do remember, because we was crossing all night, there was a, uh, a milkman. It was a horse and wagon deal in Paris. And when I saw that this was a milkman, I thought, holy Christ, i gotta have, I got to have a bottle of milk. And so we stopped him, and uh, we each bought a bottle, bottle of milk, and, and we paid him with cigarettes. 
Well, there they have them. As, you know how a fruit jar has that wire business on it, you know? Mm -hmm. and the, well, this had that wire business only in a cork. And that's the way it was bottled. And it had the cork in it like that. And so we, my friend and I, we each bought a, a bottle of milk from the guy in Hall of Christ. That really was, was really good, you know? I hadn't had a bottle of milk in three years. And, uh, so we bought this bottle of milk, but that was the thing that I remember about Paris mm -hmm. is having a bottle of milk. But and we went, you know, had, had a we had a good time. And neither of us were drinkers or anything, mm -hmm. so you know, it, it was no problem. But when I got there and I told him, I said, "Now we're leaving at a certain time." I give him this three mm -hmm. o'clock Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. You be here, mm -hmm. otherwise you're going to walk back. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a bunch of baloney. Yeah, that wasn't true at all because I know that that it wasn't going to happen. But I told, I laid the law down, you know. Well, a lot of them didn't. They got back, you know. But there was always a couple of three, four stragglers, you know, that didn't show up. And the guys would be there waiting, you know. And and then me, I I I I wanted to go back with all of them. I didn't want to leave anybody. So I, I had the problem of pacifying the guys that were there. They were anxious to go and they were tired, tired of waiting and all this, you know. And I, I, I finally waited them out and here comes a guy drunk and he's staggering and, you know, and they loaded them on the truck and, and you know, before we finally made all the guys that were supposed to be there, the number, I think, was about 20. Mm -hmm. And then we went back to the river. But, but that was a big deal of of the camp areas, uh, Chesterfield. Chesterfield. All right. And when I did get a uh, a ship, it was a victory ship. Mm -hmm. Victory, a pretty new one. I, I forget what the name of it was, but it was pretty new. And uh, it wasn't a troop transport or anything, but we uh, were able to uh, uh, lay on the deck and uh, up on deck and soak up the sunshine and watch the you know the ocean and. It was a nice trip going back. But that was in the middle of winter by then. Uh, or had it? Because well, you get. Yeah, I got home and it was in it was in the winter. Yeah, in January uh, was when you get home. Yeah. I think, so yeah. Well, it, it, when we got to New York, or they, they dumped us off. I don't remember much, but mm -hmm. uh, they uh, um, just told us to go to the nearest. They t had picked out where the nearest. Uh, army camp or place mm -hmm. where you could be mustered out. Right. And I was, uh, it was down the, uh, I thought it was the Great Lakes Naval uh, Station, Chicago. Thing, or, but it was down there by Chicago. But it, it was, uh, what the hell was the was, name? Well, it was Fort Sheridan, which that's is the right. Army base. There you yeah. go, Fort Sheridan. Yep, yeah, that's where it was. And uh, I was all alone there, and uh, uh, that's where I was mustered out. And I got about 150 bucks, and uh, I went into Chicago. That wasn't too far, and uh, I I got a train to Muskegon, uh, P and M. Mm -hmm. and it was a night. It was a night. I must. I got a home about in Muskegon about maybe 10 o'clock or so at night, and uh, I uh, got, came to into that. It's now a tourist resort thing down around Western Avenue, but by the Anaconda or uh, Amazon. And I walked down uh, Western Avenue to I was looking for a telephone, and I got down to Terra Street, and there was a Greyhound station there, and, and I went in there and I called my sister. That was the only one I knew uh, that I looked up in the phone book, and uh, her husband came and picked me up. And I spent the night there in, uh, with my sister. But this is the big surprise. I thought everything was going to be the same as when I left. It wasn't. It wasn't. No, my dad. My dad was not one to write or anything, so it just, I didn't know anything about this. He remarried while I was I was gone. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother had come home. Uh, he'd come home probably six months or so before I did. And my dad had bought a tavern in Holton, and uh, they were living in Holton, and they weren't at where I used to mm -hmm. live. Uh, on, you know, my dad still owned the house, but 
they weren't living there, mm -hmm. and they moved out of there and everything. But that wasn't there anymore. So I was looking for my clothes and my things, you know, and thing, but they were all gone. There wasn't mm -hmm. a damn thing, not one thing. You know, kids had yeah, some things, sure. you know. I got a baseball glove, and you know, we had some things. Not a thing. That wasn't a damn thing. So they must have thought I was not going to come back or something, and they dumped it all when they moved. And they had a very small place next to the tavern there in Holton. And my dad had got on the sauce, and he was uh, not himself at all. But I understood, too, you know, that he was alone when I was taken away and my brother was gone. He was alone. Mm -hmm. And I know what alone, living alone is like. I've lived alone almost for six years. It ain't good. So I, my dad was a very good dad. And I never faulted him for getting married. And I never faulted him for what he did. And I, I, I always thought he was a great dad. But it wasn't the way I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I assumed it was going to be. It was tough. Yeah. But uh, my brother... Uh, he he kind of took to the bar business. He liked it. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I, I I couldn't get far enough away from it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to do. I was up in Holton, and I didn't have no car. Mm -hmm. I didn't have no clothes. I didn't have nothing. So it was kind of tough. And uh, I couldn't go nowhere. But my dad would let me once in a while take his car. He had a he had a nice car when we left it in 1941. But he must have traded it off for something, and he had a kind of a, it was a coupe of some kind. It wasn't much of a car at all. But once in a while, he let me take it. But, uh, you know, Holton was quite a ways from Muskegon. But my brother, while he was uh, home, he made a, uh, he met a friend that was in the G. Uh, he was an officer. Uh, it was a friend that lived up that way. and. Uh, they made he made friends with them and they were going to go to uh, uh, business college on the uh, GI Bill mm -hmm. and uh, they had made arrangements for this school down in Battle Creek and uh, so I, I I said well how about me going along too mm -hmm. and this little coupe he had that was his own was the car he had it, it, I could still the three of us could get in it and. So I com or, uh, convinced them that I, I could help them with the, the rental and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, you know. And so I was included, and we rented a, a upstairs of a house in Battle Creek, not too far from the school. Mm -hmm. And we went to business college and on the GI Bill, mm -hmm. and uh, my brother. He went, and then this, his name was Ward, Ward what? Well, that was the other guy, mm -hmm. Ward, I don't remember his last name. And so I went to business college, and uh, and then when the, the term ended by my brother, he went his way, and I went my way, and everything, and I went back to Muskegon, and I, uh, uh, boarded at a at a house on uh, John Street and I, I I just boarded there and I ate out uh, all my meals and everything but I didn't want to establish myself or anything but my dad had this apartment above the house where we used to live mm -hmm. but I didn't want to buy a lot of furniture or buy furniture and everything like that so I didn't but uh, I went to work for uh, uh, John Wood, they made gas pumps, mm -hmm. and I worked in the uh, in the cost accounting department. It was all right. I learned a lot, but I didn't like it. And uh, this ward that I told you about that we went mm -hmm. to school with uh, and business school with, he kept in contact with me. And one day, he told me, he says, he got a job with a... Uh, it was called the Michigan Foundry Supply Company, and uh, the owner of the supply company also owned a foundry. It was called Wiener Foundry. He says they're looking for uh, somebody to for their office. Uh, why don't you go see him? 
so I went there and I, I, I got the job. Uh, and, and it, what it was is uh, I was going to be the billing clerk. And I, what I did, I, I did the billing and uh, uh, kept track of the uh, production mm -hmm. and, and so forth. And I dealt a lot with the Continental uh, Expeditors. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest customer of the, mm -hmm. uh, the foundry. But uh, I worked about just a, a desk away from where the purchasing agent uh, worked. And so I knew pretty much all the, what was going on in the purchasing. And uh, he uh, would have days off and maybe he'd get sick or mm -hmm. uh, sometimes vacation or so, and then I'd take over as, in the purchasing. Well, he quit one day. He was from the south. He was a southerner. Mm -hmm. And uh, he went back south. And so I just stepped over and, and I took over the mm -hmm. purchasing. And uh, I, and I don't mean to brag, but I was a hell of a lot better purchasing <laughs> agent than he was. But uh, I, uh, I learned the purchasing business. Well, uh, I, was not, I wasn't married or anything. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was single. And I, I was just bumming around. I was just loose, you know. And it, I, I just couldn't settle down. I didn't know. Anything. When I came home, my girlfriend that I had been corresponding with and been, had before the war, she was going to college. She was down in uh, Ann Arbor. She was going to U of M. I went down there once and we went to a football game, but you know, that, that she's down there and I'm here, you know. So then we, we just fell apart for about five years. I was here, here and I went my way and she went hers. And, uh, I, I don't know how the hell we got back together, but uh, I think it was by, by mail. Mm -hmm. uh, she, when, when we got back to, to finding out what she was doing and so forth, she was working for DuPont down in, uh, in, where was it, Waynesboro, Virginia, in the Orlon plant. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, she graduated from the U of M as a, a, in chemistry, mm -hmm. as a major in chemistry. Smart gal, holy Christ, she was smart. Well, uh, we got writing back and forth, you know. Pretty soon she says, well, why don't you come down and, and visit me down there, you know. And I thought, well, what the hell she goes. So I went down and I spent uh, a, a few days down there with her. She arranged probably to uh, stay in a house pretty close to where she lived and, and with some other mm -hmm. people that worked at DuPont. She took me through the Orlon plant and DuPont and oh, showed me all around down in, the, in uh, Virginia there, you know. And uh, the letter writing continued, you know. And she didn't like being away from home. She'd never been away from out up and skiing in her life better than when she went to college. She didn't like being so away f far from her family. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't hard to convince her that, you know, she ought to come back to Muskegon. I wasn't even, I didn't even have a job because I'd quit. And uh, she came back to Muskegon and we got married. I didn't have a job or a damn thing. And we, we moved into where I used to live when I was uh, before the war. Mm -hmm. In this apartment where my dad and my brother and I uh, batched it. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that worked out. But that's the way it was. But it was tough. It was tough. I, I, that was the worst years of my life. Even though I was single and free and everything, and it was it was the worst time of my life. I had no connection anymore, yeah. and uh, uh, I had no for, for so long. I had no decent clothes. Uh, when we were down in Battle Creek, our uh, noon hours were spent. Uh, we'd have lunch. It was always at a Chinese place. We always had at the Chinese place. Mm -hmm. Then we would go around to all the stores, like Montgomery Wards, Penny's, Sears and Roebuck, all the stores that would have clothes. Mm -hmm. 
and we would see whether they had any anything that we uh, we could wear or anything. And the clerks in the store, they got to know us, Christ, and everything. And some of them were very cooperative, you know, and we'd just tell them what size, you know, we have, and they'd stick it underneath the counter for us. And, you know, a shirt was, we didn't have no shirts. We had GI shirts, you know. Mm -hmm. That's why you never seen very many people that had a complete uniform, because mm -hmm. they wore them out, you know. Mm -hmm. I had a blouse, uh, or an Ike, Ike, Ike uh, jacket, mm -hmm. and that's about all I had left, you know. But all the rest of it, I, I wore it out, you know. And uh, eventually, you know, you get a, a, sh a shirt, and then you maybe get a, uh, some socks and you get some uh, stuff, you know, and then you get a, a sweatshirt or a sweater or a jacket or something, you know, and eventually you, know, you get an, enough so that you can look like a civilian again, yeah. you know, and that's the way it was, you know. Now, after you got married then, did you kind of get focused and find regular work or what you do? Well, I tell you, this is what the, a godsend. When I was working at the Sweeter Foundry, there was a young engineer that came one day when I was a person, and they were—they uh, had uh, suddenly uh, got hooked up with a pipeline, a Panhandle Eastern pipeline, and they had a lot of gas, mm -hmm. and they were out peddling. They wanted to well, get some uh, customers, mm -hmm. and this Wiener Foundry you know, used a lot of—it was—it was. Uh, uh, it was uh, what was it? It was heavy oil. Mm -hmm. In other words, if it, if it wasn't heated, it would get like lard. Yeah. And they used it for their core ovens and, and their uh, annealing ovens and stuff. So they used a lot of that mm -hmm. uh, heavy oil. He came there one day and he was peddling his his gas. And I was very good to him and everything. You know, and I said, uh, he wanted to see, you know, the foundry, how, uh, how much we used uh, uh, fuel oil and all this, heavy oil and stuff. So I took him and showed him around, you know, and spent a lot of time with him, you know, showed him where, you know, how, how, how uh, you know, much, how many core ovens we had and how many annealing ovens and all this stuff, you know, and everything. And he, he tried to convince me to switch everything, you know, to... Mm -hmm. Well, that's a big job, and it's a lot of money to switch over to natural gas. Mm -hmm. We didn't, but I was very nice to him and everything, you know. Well, uh, when I got married, uh, I knew all these guys at uh, the Continental that I dealt with mm -hmm. when I was at Wieners. And fortunately, the, the chief Pepsi person agent at the Continental at the time was named Morris Ramsey. Mm -hmm. And they always thought I was his son. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever I was mentioned Ramsey, the, the association was with was, was him. So uh, I I went to work for uh, uh, Continental. I was gonna I thought I was gonna be a buyer at, at, in the Continental at the moment, but no, I didn't get a buyer. I I was what I did was uh, I reconciled. Uh, vendors invoices with a purchasing agent, in other words, with a purchasing order. If they purchased it and they said that it was going to cost a dollar and they charged a dollar and a quarter on an invoice, they didn't pay it. There had to be some reconciliation. I mean, I had to be the approver say, well, mm -hmm. uh, no, you, you pay a dollar or you pay a dollar and a quarter. I was the one, but it was a hassle, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, they was, they was always after me for, oh, approve this, approve this, approve this, you know. Man. They're, they're a good outfit, you know, that's a bullshit. <laughs> this is the price of the person they ordered, and they, they took it, and that's what they get, you know. Mm -hmm. So I was in that kind of a, I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. One day, one of the guys that worked at the desk or next to me or so, uh, he was an older guy. He went to one of these lunch deals that they have at, at noon, you know, it was the Qantas Club yeah. or whatever they go. Well, he met the purchasing agent of the gas company mm -hmm. at, at this thing. And they got to talking apparently, and this purchasing agent at the gas company, somebody was looking for somebody to uh, to work with, to come in and, and, and work in the at the gas company purchasing. So when he came back, he told me about that, you know. So, I, so I, he said, "You ought to go down and, and see him." So I did, 
and he, he hired me. And he was an older guy, and he was uh, interested in retiring. You know, he was he was on his way out. But uh, when he hired me, you know, uh, I wondered what they hired me, what I was going to do. You know, well, when I asked him, you know, what, what we wanted me to do. He says, well, just learn the gas company business. He says, no, just learn the gas company business. And I says, uh, how do I do that? And he says, well, uh, he, he was in charge of all the stock rooms and all the things that were the, stored all the gills. And that was part of the purchasing department where they had these guys that, that took care of the stock rooms. And so he, he says, go over to the stock room. He says, see what we buy and all that kind of stuff. Give you a kind of real feel hand, you know. So I went over there, you know, and I learned, well, this is what they buy, and this is what you buy, and I, I learned, you know, that this is the kind of stuff that they, they buy, and this is what it is, and this is what it is, and I busy on you know. So pretty soon, the guys in the stock room, they realized that I was the one that was pretty much the guy, never don't, said that I was the boss or anything like that, you know, but I would, I would do this. I would say to him you know, that they had an antiquated thing. It was they handled appliances too, like ranges and water heaters and stuff. And they had this antiquated thing that they'd stack it up, they'd crank it, and it'd go up, and they'd push it off, and then, and then they'd end crank it, and they'd go down in. I said, "Where the hell did you get that thing?" Oh, he's had it forever, you know. And I said, "You need a forklift truck." And they said, "Yeah, we would but wanted them for a long time." And I said, I'll get you a forklift truck. Mm -hmm. They thought I was blowing smoke. I got him a forklift truck. And then every time, you know, I would tell him something, you know, well, uh, we had to hire a uh, job truck and crane company to unload the, uh, the pipe whenever we got it in, loads of big heavy pipe and stuff. That was out in the yard in, in the Heights. I thought, that's crazy. We got to have a, 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 a lift of our own, you know. I'll get you a hydro lift. They thought I was blowing smoke again, you know, but in conjunction with the use of the, dist of the distribution department, the guy that run that, Joe Buck, he knew that well, this would be handy to have mm -hmm. around too because they had a lot of heavy stuff too. Mm -hmm. So between the, the, the Joe Buck and I, we, we got a hydro lift. So they got to know that I wasn't just blowing smoke all mm -hmm. the time, and they realized that uh, his name was Ken Gable, that he had kind of turned the running of the stock rooms and them over to me. So I learned pretty much the basic stuff. I knew what it, when I was buying something, I knew what the hell it was. So then he let things loosen up a little bit, and then pretty soon uh, I was buying uh, stuff. And uh, the, the vendors that came in and other things, you know, he, they would make a courtesy call to him and, mm -hmm. and so forth. But then when they wanted the order and they got down to the really nitty gritty, they'd come to me. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was really the one that was doing it. But I never signed my name on anything. He was always mm -hmm. there. And I was often there when he was on vacation or sick or someplace he wasn't there. I put his name and never, anything that ever letter I wrote where I was, I was mm -hmm. doing, it was always went through him and it, it was his okay and everything. And, but they know eventually, you know, who, who was the one that was buying the stuff. And everything. so I, for years I was, I was really the one and he, he didn't, he didn't pay any attention to what was going on or anything. I was, I was it just. Mm -hmm. Go see Ramsey. Go see Lauren. That's you know, he'd sell the vendors, and they all knew that, you know. And I was a lot different than he was. He was a he had a lot of them that these vendors had them in his pocket, in their pocket, mm -hmm. you know. I wasn't that way at all. But <laughs> I had to go along as long as he was yeah. a person. Had to. But eventually he retired, and then. Uh, the manager of the outfit didn't like me. Mm -hmm. I was too 
too aggressive. Uh, I, I, and uh, he didn't like me, but he, he knew that he had to okay me because I was the only one that, that could replace him. Yeah. You know. So I was appointed. And, they had a picture in the paper that, you know, I was now being mm -hmm. appointed the and so I got a picture of that was in the paper. Then I was the first in the engine. I made a hell of a lot of changes. These guys that were in his pocket and all mm -hmm. that, you know, this has changed, this is this is different. But uh, I uh, I run a, a real tight ship and uh, I I really I got to be very uh, what you would call uh, influential, or uh, I had a lot of uh, a lot of weight, uh, and because I also had the responsibility of the maintenance of the buildings, mm -hmm. and that was also part of it. But uh, I, I worked very well with with the other operating people, and I'll tell you how I operated, and I knew how this this works. Uh, I got to know the operating people real well, but the vendors had to go through me to get mm -hmm. to them. And when something happened or something that looked good to me and I thought they should be, I would bring the vendor this, uh, in dinner soon and, and I, I made a relationship with mm -hmm. them. But the vendors always knew that they had to see me first. And I brought them some good, good uh, advice and some good materials and things. So I had a good relationship with them. And uh, 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 this one particular one, this is, this is interesting. Uh, th they had a very big expansion program at the time where they were going into all the different small towns like Whitehall and Montague, Shelby, Hart, and all that. So there's a lot of going on. Well, uh, and so they uh, had to work a lot of Saturdays and overtime. And well, this, this one Saturday, this Jill Buck, he was in charge of the distribution of this, all of this stuff, this construction and everything. He, he was, in his family, they were scheduled to go to their cottage or someplace up north, and they, they had planned this for some time, they're going to spend the weekend or something. And he had, he had to work, he said that he had to work because of some big project or something going on. And... Uh, he was really perturbed that, you know, he was, because his whole family was disappointed. Mm -hmm. I told Joe, I said, Joe, you go, I'll take care of things. He looked at me, he said, no, I can't do that. I, I said, Joe, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. So I convinced him that I would take care of it. And don't worry about it. I'll, I'll see that everything is all set, Monday morning, you'll never know that uh, nothing happened. I never mention anything in Monday morning, I never, I never go near him or anything like that, you know. Everything is perfect going along, you know. He comes to me and says, well, how did it go? Well, okay. The, the, the lady starts asking me questions, you know, about, you know, how did this go on? And I said, well, I'm okay. And I made no big deal of it, you know. So pretty soon they got to know that if they wanted something done, just let me let me know, and I took care of it. And I got into a lot of things that I shouldn't have been. But Joe was very, very in, he was a good good guy to operate with. Okay. I'll tell you one deal that re really made made them take notice. Uh, this engineer that came to see me when I was down at Wiener Foundry. They made him the district manager after this one that didn't like me. Mm -hmm. he, he was made this district manager. So he knew me uh, from the time that I met him uh, down at the yeah. Foundry. And uh, so I had a better relationship. Well, anyway, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, this, is, this was one big deal. That, they was buying gasoline, and, and, and I was responsible for buying it, and the, the stock department, they uh, went to the stock department to uh, get their gasoline. The stock people uh, 
fill the gas tanks when they needed gas and so forth. They kept track of it. Old pump that didn't know they had a 500 gallon uh, storage tank and was paying 18 cents a gallon for gasoline at the time. And I couldn't see that at all. And so I worked up all the things, what it would cost to put in a 10,000 gallon tank, new uh, uh, pump with a, a, with a printed, uh, printer in it that printed what gas was taken out of it and all this, it was up to date, you know. And uh, what was going to happen was that I was going to be able to buy gas for 9 cents a gallon instead of 18. And I worked this all up, how much it was going to cost to do it and where, but everything. But I had to go to Joe because he was going to be responsible after I this worked out because his night crew that was in the garage was going to have to dispense the gas at night. And it was going to be in his area and the gas pump and everything was going to be moved from the stock area to, to his area. So it was a kind of a joint deal. But I had everything all worked out down to the nickel, you know. The payoff time was going to be two years, and it would be all paid off and all that. So my boss, which, which was, he was still there then, and, and this Joe Buck, who was in, the head of the distribution department, uh, they went to the, the budget uh, meeting that they had where they uh, developed the budget that Muskegon was going to supply or ask what money they wanted for it in Detroit, which was the ones that run the company or owned the company. Uh, it went through just like that. And they